Sounds sounds good. Uh, so ev- thank you, thank you. And uh, this is our uh, our brother and executive producer, Pavel Edward, has made this possible. Everyone, maintain him in your thoughts and prayers. As I think he's contracted uh, something, so hopefully it doesn't need to go to the doctor to make certain he doesn't, you know, have uh, bronchitis or something or walk in pneumonia. Which I've suffered myself in the past, and uh, and uh, you know it's I I had conditions like that for months at a time. I mean, like literally the majority of a year, I've gone with walking pneumonia. Uh, so uh, wouldn't want him to suffer that. So if this goes beyond uh, several days or into a week or so, uh, it, I'm, we're definitely going to force him to go to a doctor, even if it's at gunpoint, uh, check into an ambulatory care clinic or something. But uh, other than that. Um, I want to let everyone know that we did an episode recently with uh, Justin White uh, that has been published along with the episode uh, dedicated to my late sainted Cyrus, my uh, mother, Diana Suchin Lin Takabayashi Hideko uh, Dietrich. And um, I don't want anyone reviewing those till after we're done with transmission tonight. That goes without saying. So uh, sometime after transmission, I'll be publishing uh, links on uh, posts on my timelines uh, on Facebook uh, so that people can link those uh, videos directly, uh, which they can do, of course, uh, by going to the Dietrich channel on YouTube. Uh, And uh, right now, of course, listen to the live transmission. And I want to, of course, provide a shout out to all our uh, dear friends and relations uh, our uh, lovely grand madam Ramona Halitha Henry, who has just now posted uh, onto my timeline her normal post uh, in which she activates a thread uh, on which she places references to uh, subjects that I speak of so that she can uh, provide uh, uh, depth uh, or collateral information, uh, verification for what I say. I ask everyone to take advantage of her wonderful post. It's always a golden star that she says it's showtime. And uh, so people can find that on my personal friends page and reference the uh, thread of comments that she enters because those are overwhelmingly links to um, uh, evidence and uh, references for the subject matter that I uh, bring forth. So uh, aside from all of that, uh, a shout out to everyone we know and love, my Maki benefactress, uh, of course, my primary sponsors, uh, the lovely Fabia Floriani, um, and a shout out to her. I still have to give her a call sometime in the very near future. Ben Estenia has got to give him a call. Both of them, uh, you know, prior to the end of this month, uh, both of them were so kind during the holiday season. And uh, a shout out, of course, to my medical cosmetologist, V. Clark. Uh, shout out to uh, uh, my surrogate son, who, of course, remains unnamed for his security. Uh, shout out to the grand madam, uh, Judith Ager. Uh, oh, hopefully she comes on with us in January to follow up on uh, the uh, very important subjects that she barely introduced. And uh, aside from that, we'll go into what we need to go into uh, tonight. Uh, today begins, uh, today began uh, Las Posadas. Uh, now, just let me check on to what the Grand Madam Ramona Halitha Henry is saying. And uh, she's confirming, of course, that we are perfectly loud and clear. God bless her. And uh, uh, couldn't do without her a uh, wonderful human being. And uh, so today uh, began Las Posadas, which is a nine-day festival celebrated by Christians in Mexico and parts of the United States, uh, translated as the Inns. It commemorates Mary and Joseph's biblical journey to Bethlehem, where Mary gave birth to Jesus Christos. And uh, of course, I will be addressing uh, the true history of Christianity in uh, probably my next transmission or the one after that. And uh, it's sad that when we think of uh, Mary and Joseph, they were wanderers. They were essentially, some would say, illegal immigrants. And uh, in this day and age, Trump makes things nearly impossible for asylum seekers, which is what Mary and Joseph were, though they fled because, of course, uh, the king of the land, uh, Herod, uh, wanted uh, the baby Jesus Christus dead, who at the time uh, that uh, Herod was searching for him was actually 
uh, at least uh, a year or so old, at least, uh, may have been actually a very young, very young teenager, someone uh, in, in a sense, maybe someone who is in the age of uh, uh, three to six years of age, but like probably three years of age, approximate. This is all we could do is approximate. Uh, but uh, he was obviously aged in terms of his intellect and his emotional development well beyond his years, uh, one could say infinitely, and, uh, and wise, of course, uh, beyond any human years. So that was uh, something that uh, makes our next story so sad. Uh, just a little bit of uh, a news item here uh, in terms of Trump making things nearly impossible for asylum seekers before I get into the history of tonight. And uh, that will be covered comparatively very briefly. And uh, then what we will do is, uh, of course, go into the context of current events. Uh, but uh, in terms of our um, sad story uh, from the border, uh, a seven-year-old girl from Guatemala died of dehydration and shock after she was taken into Border Patrol custody last week for crossing into the United States illegally with her father and a large group of migrants along a remote span of the New Mexico desert. Uh, this was confirmed by the United States Customs and Border Protection on Thursday. Um, so uh, it's part of this ongoing tragedy, which I will get into again during this transmission, this cycle of violence that needs not even be perpetrated and is simply done so, so that people can get a vicarious thrill out of uh, basically abusing and murdering others. And by people getting a vicarious thrill, I'm not simply talking about Donald Trump and his ilk. I'm speaking of all of you bastards who voted for him and all of you bastards who continue to uh, follow his cult. So uh, that brings us, of course, to a stolen Holocaust and uh, what exactly that term means. I've uh, tried to educate people in this before. Uh, it cannot be overemphasized uh, in terms of... Uh, the um, Holocaust, uh, originally, it was a special kind of Hebrew sacrifice to God, uh, who is not, of course, the Christian God, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews as a tribe wandering the desert, is not your God as a Christian. That is a war God, a psychotic uh, entity of the desert demanding blood sacrifice, uh, in terms of hundreds of thousands of lives, if not millions. Uh, at the time, of course, uh, populations were much smaller, uh, but uh, the population or demographic equivalent in today's terms would be millions of people that died uh, to satisfy the bloodlust, to sate, as they would say, this particular vile entity uh, that the Jews worshipped while wandering the desert, who demanded uh, Holocaust. So this Holocaust was specifically a Hebrew sacrifice unto Yahweh uh, or Yahshua uh, in the Hebraic. Uh, I know I'm butchering that. The original Hebraic uh, word for the Yah or the God being uh, almost unpronounceable or, 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 or literally unpronounceable, similar to the barbarous names used for the entities of the Lovecraft mythos. Now, uh, in terms of uh, that God, this Holocaust was this burnt offering that had to be completely consumed by the flames. So that God got everything and nothing was left for man. Uh, the Holocaust, of course, turned out to be an extremely useful ritual when the Hebrews decided to improve their economic lot in the world. When they left Egypt and set their sights on the fertile land of Canaan, they were, of course, faced with the awkward fact that there were, their promised land was already occupied by a lot of people who liked it very much and didn't want to move. But a practical and pious final solution was at hand. The Hebrews simply dedicated their enemy population to their God and uh, burned uh, the land of Canaan to the root. Uh, all structures, all peoples, all plants, all animals. And uh, towards that end, of course, their God was satisfied and they inherited Canaan. And uh, that, of course, is the generally the same area of land that today you know of as Israel. Now, this Holocaust was repeated again in World War II. And speaking of the true Holocaust, not what had happened to the Israelis, because the Holocaust, the Hebrew sacrifice, 
to their Yeshua, uh, their God, uh, was always of living beings. Uh, the being had to be burned alive, animal, plant, uh, the human or vegetable. Uh, and that was done by the firebombing of the allies of the Axis nations. Uh, so when it came to the Holocaust as conducted against the Jews, which you are familiar with through uh, just decades of indoctrination, uh, there is no evidence that's recorded, though it may well have happened, of Jews being cast into the ovens alive. I mean, when you're faced with a hot oven, threat of death don't mean shit. It doesn't matter if they have guns or bayonets pointed at you. You're not going to go into a hot oven alive. You're going to charge the individual with their bullets and bayonets, and you're going to uh, do that specifically so they will kill you so that you don't go into the hot oven alive. So the, the uh, idea of people going inside of the ovens alive is preposterous. The, the, no one has ever suggested that. Obviously, many Jews exited the death camps only through the chimneys. They went to the ovens, but they did so dead. Uh, that mercy was never uh, bestowed upon Axis civilians. When the uh, Brits and the Americans uh, bombed uh, and generated firestorms uh, via the Allied bombing, then uh, many uh, Axis civilians burned alive. The overwhelming majority of them uh, people unfit for the battlefield, uh, such as women, children, senior citizens, and infants. Uh, there were 600,000 Germans who died on the West Front of World War II alone. They were not sold out and holding the Atlantic Wall. They were all women, children, infants in cribs, senior citizens who were bedridden at home, who burned alive amidst the firestorms of Allied bombing. Civilians to the last victim. And bombs win no territory. They are pure terrorism. The word terrorism occurs again and again in bombing documentation, and it's noted in the positive for strategic bombing, both before and after each firestorm, uh, not least in the notes by Winston Churchill. The American commanders who actually authorized these war crimes used the word terrorism, along with, most specifically, Winston Churchill himself, Harris, the top bombardier of uh, Greater Britain had an obsession with killing civilians that emerges from his writings as maniacal. He disregarded the pleas of Allied commanders for bombing the retreating German supply lines. He left oil deposits untouched and, as a result, permitted what happened to be the deadliest battle of World War II for his American allies, the Ardain counteroffensive, what the Americans know as the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, all of that was made possible by oil reserves that were plainly visible uh, for targeting, not being targeted at all by bombardiers who instead concentrated all of their efforts of Allied strategic bombing on purely non-military, specifically non-military, purely civilian targets. So uh, as a result, of course, uh, Bomber Harris and his desire to bomb the crowds back to the Stone Age, uh, a term later used, of course, by Curtis LeMay uh, against the Vietnamese. Uh, all of this, of course, uh, prolonged rather than shortened the war. The effectiveness of mass terror bombardment depends on the readiness of the bombed to be terrorized. The Germans didn't oblige, nor did the Vietnamese. Railroads destroyed by day were reconstructed overnight. Productivity in Germany increased throughout the war. And, of course, the oil reserves left unmolested by the strategic bombers were utilized by Adolf Hitler to conduct the battle of the Ardain counteroffensive. Uh, specifically, of course, uh, there were several names for different components of that operation. In the German, the overall strategic name for the operation was, in English, Watch on the Rhine. In the German, Unternehmen Wacht am Rhein, Operation Watch on the Rhine. 
and uh, it started uh, in uh, this date today, uh, December 16th, uh, 74 years ago, uh, I believe, uh, in 1944. And uh, so that was the second deadliest battle in American history. Uh, the deadliest war in American history that produced the most fatalities for the United States was, of course, the American Civil War between the states, because all civil wars are far more lethal for all belligerents that participate in their civil wars than uh, wars against foreign enemies ever can be, because it's like domestic disputes. Domestic disputes are always the most violent. And they always uh, uh, kill the most people. Now, I'm told that we're getting a lot of static, uh, probably because it's raining and uh, we have a poor connection. And uh, the internet connection, of course, uh, will be uh, flummoxed uh, by the weather. Uh, Pavel Edward will uh, let me know if there's any other developments. Let me see if I can access the chat and see if he's uh, giving me any messages. He is typing something. Um, so, in the uh, event that uh, people cannot uh, hear me clearly because of the rain and the weather hitting Skype, uh, it, it will clear, so be patient, and I'm told it has. Uh, but at the same time, always know that we get far better recording than we do uh, transmission when we burn bandwidth, and you can always reference later on, uh, even after, uh, immediately after. I close transmission. It'll be burning bandwidth in cycle on the stream uh, until we uh, have it do otherwise. So uh, I'm essentially going to be repeating exactly what I say uh, for you to access uh, for the uh, foreseeable future until, of course, we publish it in a um, video when it'll its quality will be even higher. So um, in terms of the uh, uh, our our Dane counteroffensive, the Operation Watch on the Rhine, uh, which had consistent uh, operations that were integral to it. Um, Americans know it by the Battle of the Bulge because American soldiers weren't certain what to call the battle at all. Uh, it was a German penetration into the American lines, which the Americans had then surrounded and eventually sealed off. Uh, the word for that in the First World War was salient, uh, but that, of course, was far too educated a term uh, for the American public. Uh, so an American journalist interviewing George S. Patton needed a unique American-sounding, basically a soundbite uh, that would become shorthand for the battle and the word bulge uh, popped into his mind. It was adopted immediately, and it stuck. And then we got the incredibly stupid term, Battle of the Bulge. Uh, now, Hitler's decision to launch the Ardain counteroffensive uh, was far more political than military. Now, normally, of course, I condemn any kind of uh, action that is uh, political in its objectives as opposed to military when it comes to uh, combat in the field. Uh, the differences, of course, become quite blurred when you're dealing with strategic warfare at that level of warfare, which is uh, both strategic and operational that Adolf Hitler was uh, contending with, then, of course, everything is political anyway. As uh, Karl von Clausewitz said, the man who wrote the book on warfare in the West, uh, this is an individual who uh, basically uh, ascertained that all warfare be an extension of politics. And uh, as a result, um, everything you do in the field is political anyway, as uh, acknowledged by all historical figures, such as Napoleon Bonaparte, who have had to deal with the reality of war. Uh, this is why in Vietnam, it got political to the point where at the tactical level, uh, the special forces were aiming through their actions to secure hearts and minds. So at that point, we're going far beyond just normal uh, conflict. We are uh, entering uh, what is essentially the uh, world of psyops, of, uh, of, of, of winning the uh, public. Of uh, We're going into an area that is, of course, the reality 
of violence processing in order to attain a political objective. Now, as a mercenary, when I was contracted in the field, I usually did not have to deal with the political aspects of combat operations. Uh, in Hitler's situation, his political matrix was purely domestic when it came to launching the Ardennes Offensive. So um, I, why this is not obvious to military historians, be beyond me. But uh, the decision by Adolf Hitler to launch the Ardennes attack, and it was his alone, was political as opposed to the traditional view that this was some last ditch uh, attempt to turn the military situation around uh, as it stood manifest towards the closure of the year 1944. Rather, Adolf Hitler's attempt to, was to reassert his personal political control over the German general staff and the entire National Socialist hierarchy. It was a reaction to the von Stauffenberg bomb attempt on his life on the 20th of July in 1944. Now, after that, he had to secure himself. He was understandably in a state of some shock. He didn't know whom to trust. His health, in a sense, spiraled for at least a period of time. And uh, the genesis of Adolf Hitler's plans to launch the Ardennes counteroffensive was his grappling to retain control of the direction of military affairs and prove to the Third Reich that he was still very much the man at the top in total control. Now, that is, of course, contextualized within the mythological and cultural significance of forests to the Aryan psyche. Uh, the Ardennes campaign fits into this uh, in terms of why Adolf Hitler specifically chose the Ardennes. Uh, it was all his plan. Everything about it had significance. So the Ardennes was more than simply a region where the Allies were weak. Uh, when one goes back over Adolf Hitler's pronouncements, his beliefs, his fascination with Wagner, in Wagner, a huge amount of the action takes place in woods and forests. This taps into the ancient Nordic beliefs and gods that woods be a place of testing for human beings. So if you uh, overview the National Socialist faith, and remember National Socialism, National Socialism, as is the correct pronunciation, National Socialism in the English, uh, is not a political ideology, it is a religion. And the majority of the faith is manifest specifically in the Schutzstaffel as the priesthood of that religion, the SS. And within this context, woods and forests crop up within the Wagnerian uh, ideology or the uh, part of that faith, that composition of that faith, kind of like the uh, part of the uh, ode or the, the um, song of that particular religion, one of their liturgical rites or sources thereof. Uh, within there, the uh, aurochs of the primal forest are uh, part of that thematic. And even the code name for the, uh, the armored spearhead of the Ardain offensive, uh, Herbstnebel, uh, Autumn Mist, has very deep Wagnerian connotations. Wagner uses mist or smoke to announce the arrival of foreboding or ominousness, the incoming evil. So it was no accident that the attack against the Americans was launched from large forests in heavy fog. So Adolf Hitler, of course, had a very low opinion of the Americans as a fighting force, justifiably so, having nothing to do with what the propagandists will say uh, any concept of uh, the Americans being mongrelized. Uh, he saw the Americans as basically race traitorous Germans. Uh, the overwhelming majority of them, of course, were of German heritage, 
uh, Eisenhower himself, of course, had a distinctively German name. Uh, so in terms of that, uh, he saw them as race traders and therefore scum of the earth, but viler than any other uh, person of any other race who the Germans were up against. So that's where the contempt comes from. And, uh, and because of the inability, despite the fact that productivity kept increasing in Germany, the biggest problem was logistical supply and being able to get what was manufactured to the front lines. Now, that, of course, was such a challenge based on all of the resources that had to go to the Eastern Front that uh, the Germans at this point in the West were very much forced to rely on what much of the world considered archaic uh, technology. In other words, they use techniques such as harnessing horses. We call it cavalry. Now, unlike what most Americans realize, there, with all of the armor that was uh, deployed on the Eastern Front, there was very little left to spare for the West. So the Germans went into the Battle of the Bulge barely better equipped than they were in 1914, World War One. Uh, they were equipped with upwards of 50,000 horses. So it was primarily a horse cavalry that was confronting the Allies in the Battle of the Bulge, similar to the position the Polish people had when the Germans conducted their Blitzkrieg uh, back in 1939. Only in this case, of course, the Germans were deploying the uh, equine cavalry, the horses, much more effectively uh, against the Americans who were fully mechanized. Now, the Americans have hid this fact from history completely, but if you do your research, you'll bet what I say to be true. Now, of course, one figure who's made to stand out of the pages uh, of history, the, the cigar-chomping American general, George S. Patton, and uh, it's uh, difficult to discuss the Battle of the Bulge without referring to George S. Patton uh, with his cigars and his trademark pearl-handled revolvers, and uh, he branded himself, and so he did very well with selling himself. But most of all, uh, the aspect of his personality that most parallels mine, but that, of course, all of my naysayers and detractors and my gang stalkers will just hate to hear, but could never deny is unbothered confidence. And that's one thing that marks out successful captains in history is a superb confidence that borders on arrogance. This is why I have so many haters, because of my overwhelming confidence, and they will decry me as being arrogant. Now, that's exactly what Patton manifests. That's the Pattonite personality. So George's Patton would always say that a perfect plan be nowhere near as good as an imperfect plan that's executed violently and immediately. I've done that all my life, and that's why I'm still alive today, so that I can regale my detractors and gang stalkers while they go crying back to each other, reassembling Belgab.com, where they can trade their child for it because they absolutely cannot stop. If you ever take a look at the television series To Catch a Predator, Every single one of the predators that they catch know they are being monitored by that television series. And when the authorities walk in, along with the men with the cameras, they know exactly who they are. They say, oh, you're the people from To Catch a Predator, and before they're taken out to jail, after they've been lured into whatever trap that has entrapped them. Because they cannot stop or control their pain harassed urges. So it is with everyone at BellGab.com. They've reassembled it so they can have a place to trade their pay to ass porn because they cannot stop themselves. They have to do that. This is why when I brought up, of course, everything that these people have done in the name of BellGab.com, when I brought up, of course, all that uh, the individual did under the name of Stuart Allison with children, and then Richard K. Cole called up YouTube and said, oh, Douglas Dietrich is invading my private life. Of course, admitting at that point exactly who he is, and I mean, Stuart Allison has an alias, then that is how these people stand. They cannot deny themselves, 
they are open and trying to normalize what they do. So they are less and less restrained because, of course, one of their own is in office. And that is where we come back to the war of World War II. Patton hated that kind of individual, just as I do. He was an enormous threat to the rest of the military that catered to the pedopathocracy, and that's why they assassinated him. But while he was still alive and active, one of the key aspects of the Battle of the Bulge was the speed with which George S. Patton reorientated his Third Army, which was south of the Bulge, and got them to counterattack the Germans by moving north. Now, to turn an entire army around on its axis by 90 degrees and move north in the middle of winter, at almost no notice, was nigh unheard of. But George S. Patton achieved this within a couple of days, much to the amazement, uh, not even to the Germans at all, but far more so to his fellow allies, because Patton said he would do it, None of the Allies believed he could. They all dismissed him. And then he delivered in spades. Now, on the other side, one of the most compelling characters was the hero, the German Panzer commander, Joachim Piper. Now, Joachim Piper was a 28-year-old true believer in the National Socialist East faith. His whole life had been acted out in the shadow of Adolf Hitler that they all right. He had come to prominence early. He was a colonel in the weaponized security service, the Waffen SS, the Waffen meaning weaponized or armed Schutzwaffen security services. And he worked as an adjutant to Heinrich Himmler himself. He was involved in an entire series of combat actions that the Allies would deem to be war crimes on the Eastern Front, where he taught his men to regard Russian lives as being worth nothing. He and his men brought this mentality to the Western Front when they fought in the Ardennes in 1944. And they were right to do so, because I've often emphasized that Europeans should have the attitude towards white Americans that black Africans have towards black African Americans, which is one of total contempt in the baseline. Obviously, this is not a blank behavior where you're going to find this in every African. But one of the reasons why Africa is in a state of constant war and in a state of constant famine was because when the slave trade was ongoing for generations, well over 100 years, well over close to 200 years, in terms of the Western involvement, then what happened was that the European powers dealt with the hunter tribes and the warrior tribes to capture and bring unto them the gatherer tribes or the farming tribes. So for that reason, all of the land became reforested because it went fallow when all of the farmers of Africa, the gatherer tribes of Africa, were sold off to be slaves across the seas. And Africa was left a continent of naught but warriors, of naught but hunters. If there's nothing left but predators, they begin to hunt each other. The whole heritage of Africa from that point forward, moving to the situation we have today of a land that's rich in warriors and poor in food stems from that Atlantic slave trade. And these warriors, of course, look on the black Africans of North or South America, the black diaspora of African Americans, whether from Brazil or the United States or elsewhere, as the descendants of slaves of the weaker tribes, and they look on them with the contempt that a warrior has for such field workers. 
Now, all of this, of course, is ironic because naturally the food is much better in terms of quality and availability. Uh, well, one could argue that, of course, most black people eat uh, in food chains like McDonald's or did for many generations, and they get uh, filled up with steroids. But uh, all that steroid-infested meat has them growing huge, like they're birthed inside a test tube chambers or something, and they become like uh, football player size. And basketball player size, uh, many black Africans are tall enough to be basketball players, but uh, hardly ever bulky enough to be football players. Massive enough. There isn't enough food for that kind of mass in Africa. So uh, the irony is in how much better off, in a sense, uh, caloric-wise, uh, black Africans are living in the United States and elsewhere. But nevertheless, the contempt be there for them in the homeland, the, the motherland. Now, so too in the fatherland, Joachim Piper had that kind of contempt for the German descendant Yankee dogs, the lantern jawed apes from the New World, who were invading the old world, the world of his fatherland. And so he and his men knew of the stolen Holocaust, the Holocaust being perpetrated against Aryan women and children throughout the Third Reich by Allied mass bombing that was burning civilians alive in their sacrifice to the unholy entities, not only of the Old Testament, but the anti-gods of the satanic cultists who would precede Michael Aquino indeed would bring him into this world when they would hang the men they deemed to be the dozen top war criminals of the failed Reich. There were supposed to be 13 men hanged. Martin Gorman escaped, and Hermann Goering killed himself. So they were left with an unbalanced number of 11. And when they hanged them in mass sacrifice, they didn't bring in the Antichrist that they had schemed to do through their occult sacrifice. Rather, on the night of the Nuremberg hangings, they brought in the Antichrist, Arbinger. Michael Aquino was born, a blue baby. He was born dead. Then the baby was resuscitated. He claims, of course, that he is not a human soul, but a walk-in soul into that emptied baby body of a diabolic infernal entity, that he is a demon in the flesh. That's what the Americans were sacrificing millions of people for in their holocaustic firestorms, just like the firestorms generated by Donald Trump and his Republicans here in California. And that, of course, was why the men of Joachim Piper and his Schutzstaffel unit perpetrated the famous massacre just outside the town of Mamaldi, what was known as the Mamaldi Massacre. Now, of course, the Americans were so incensed at this that it wasn't enough that he was tried for war crimes after the war and spent a good part of his life in jail, after which he was released as a senior citizen and, of course, retired in his own home and estate in Alsace-Lorraine, I believe, an area of France that uh, was once German. I believe that's where he retired. I'm pretty sure it was somewhere in France. He was tracked down by a white and black Assassin, in other words, one was black African-American, the other one was a white trash American, a black trash piece of shit and a white trash piece of shit. Two young thugs tracked him down who were employed to assassinate him, and they killed Joachim Piper at the age of 75. He injured them severely. He died fighting. He used his chainsaw on them. He was out in his yard doing yard work. And when they came to kill him, he fought back with his chainsaw in his hand. And they found severed fingers and limbs of both those sons of bitches who killed him in the end. So that Schutzstaffel man died fighting in his mid-60s or 70s. Fighting two black and white American trash pieces of shit who were paid to assassinate him even though he did his time in jail for killing piece of shit Americans whose forces were firebombing civilians in a Holocaust 
a sacrifice to their anti-gods that was stolen from the German people by Jewish propaganda, which turned the Holocaust of living beings into the Holocaust of dead Jewish bodies that you know of today in terms of where all your attention and where all your sympathies lie. Well, fool that you are, of course, most of you German-descended white trash pieces of shit root against Germans so much, your own descendants, that you want to dig up these German bodies of all the Germans that were ever killed, zombify them so you can kill them again in your Nazi zombie video games. That's how sick and self-hating you white trash Americans are of your own genetic heritage. Now, in terms of the most important lessons, militarily and personally, you can take away from studying the Battle of the Bulge. One of the things to take away is how much the Allies deluded themselves as to the situation of their opponents. How much they believed, because they wanted to believe, that the Germans were a spent force. And that Hitler's ordained counteroffensive proved exactly the opposite. And Americans still do this time and time again, underappreciate the effectiveness of their opponents through to this day. And, of course, this was the trial run for any Russian invasion of Europe that would have happened had the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the Warsaw Pact gone to war because Adolf Hitler was so brilliant, so creative, so ingenious that he took the Russian units who were collaborating with the Germans and deployed them on the front line of the vanguard of the Ardennes counteroffensive. So the Americans, hearing the Russian chatter over their radios and their interceptions of German and Russian communications, they thought that Stalin had switched sides and that the Soviets were aligned with the National Socialist to take them out in the West. This is why so many Americans panicked, shit their pants, that at the Battle of the Bulge, two entire American infantry regiments surrendered, threw down their guns and surrendered without firing a fucking shot, going into prisoner status to be set behind the lines in the middle of 1940-fucking-4, in the end of 1940-fucking-4, going into January of 1940-fucking-5, and the majority of them wound up in Russian hands. And the Russians never returned them to the Americans. The American General Eisenhower saw to that. He didn't want to offend his allies, the Russians. He let them keep those regiments of American prisoners where they spent the rest of their dying days behind the Ural's Mountains of Siberia building rail track or mining various minerals or salt or logging in various gulags throughout Siberia. So, in terms of the deployment of Russians, not just using those of that ethnicity and culture, Adolf Hitler used their tactics. All the tactics he learned from them on the Eastern Front, he applied against the Americans. Massive use of mortars, what the Germans called Nebelwerfers, multi-headed mortars, like a revolver, only mortar tubes comprising the circular delivery mechanism for the mortar shells. These were the German versions of Stalin's organs. He applied those along with much smaller panzer units broken down to emulate the smaller units used by the Russians on the Eastern Front. And of course, special commando units in American uniform or British uniform as were deployed by the Soviets against the Germans when they broke up Army Group Center on the Eastern Front by people infiltrating behind the lines in German uniforms. Hitler turned all these Soviet tactics around against the Americans. It was the closest the Americans would ever experience to a Soviet multi-echelon attack if NATO and the Warsaw Pact ever went to war. And the person applying all these tactics that so destroyed American confidence and sent everyone other than George S. Patton running, Adolf Hitler.
the idea that he was even racist to the point where he wouldn't consider using quote-unquote Jewish science, such as nuclear physics, Russian tactics, such as he used more. This is how stupid the West is when they propagandize against him. He used all science as neutral, believed that, that Einstein was not so much Jewish in his ethnicity as a German citizen who was a product of German education, which is what Hitler attributed his brilliance to. So he saw his technology as simply appropriated from the German educational system. And it's something that Hitler was willing to, shall we say, reappropriate for German use with their own atomic technology. So all of that brings us to the uh, quarter of an hour left uh, in this first hour of transmission. That should be enough to dedicate to the historical nature of uh, this particular uh, day today. Um, let's go into last week and the week's end that was. William Newsom, a retired state appellate court justice and the father of our Californian governor-elect Gavin Newsom, died on Wednesday, December 12th, while I was transmitting a burning bandwidth that night. He died at the age of 84. We'll be bringing his son into transmission, uh, not personally, but in terms of uh, his intentions, rather soon within this transmission. Now, the federal government under the Russian occupation is walking it back. On the same day that William Newsom died on Wednesday, officials told Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein's office that the Trump administration no longer be considering using California military bases to house unaccompanied migrant children. That's because, of course, Douglas Dietrich exposed to the public that those children would be raped to death, gang raped, by the same kind of satanic baby raping sons of bitches that I saw in action all my life in military bases. And enough public outcry and letters were writ that the Trump government had to backwalk, moonwalk back from their pedopathocratic intentions, catering to their junta with child sacrifices. Now, you can pat yourselves on the back for that. I know many people who wrote emails and physical letters to the United States government concerning that issue. Congratulations on all. We won because of your efforts. And again, Douglas Dietrich has done something that everyone else bitches about, but no one takes us to action against. Now still, in one of those highly militarily based or developed areas, Orange County, we have fear and worry in the OC. The Trump administration is resuming its efforts to deport certain protected Vietnamese immigrants who have lived in the United States for decades, many of them having fled the creation during the Vietnam War. I will update you on that situation as it develops. I know many people who have been encouraged to write letters concerning that situation as well. And that, of course, brings us back to Vietnam. As I emphasized, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam was blamed for all America's failings, when in reality it was one of the finest armies that ever served in history. And it was the Americans who were fucking the Army of the Republic of Vietnam up, not the other way around. These fine people fought for you in Vietnam. But because they don't manifest white epidermis or Caucasian skin, they're all going to be deported back to a communist nation where they'll be considered traitors and executed to death by torture. Not just men, but women and children. How on earth can you Americans take pride in Donald Trump, who is committed to this level of deportation atrocity? You must be truly a satanic, gratuitous sadist 
literally a satanic sadist if you follow Trump and approve of deportation for deportation's sake as manifest in situations like this. You must be one sick son of a bitch or bitch if you support Trump at all. There's no excuse. There's no defense. There's no exception. Anyone who voted for Trump, may God damn you and condemn your hell, your soul to hell for eternity. You're a piece of shit. You heard it from my lips. Now, to bring up the army again, on Friday, a 23-year-old army mechanic was convicted of ambushing and executing a couple and their friend while they slept inside a Fullerton home the year before yesteryear, back in 2016. He was sentenced Friday to life in state prison without the possibility of parole. An Orange County Superior Court jury last month found Joshua Acosta guilty of the special circumstances killings of 34-year-old Christopher Yost, his 39-year-old wife Jennifer Goodwill Yost, and their 28-year-old friend Arthur Bill Boucher, all of whom were fatally shot inside the Yost's home in the early morning hours of September 24, 2016. Acosta's first target as an army-trained, baby-raping, satanic son of a bitch was Boucher, who was asleep on the couch when he was shot in the head. Acosta then moved to the master bedroom to shoot Jennifer Yost between the eyes. When the shotgun jammed, Christopher Yost took the opportunity to try to escape, but was shot in the head as he fled. Prosecutors confirmed that 27-year-old Frank Sato Felix of Sun Valley, who will also be charged with murder in connection with these slayings, helped Acosta acquire a shotgun and waited in a truck outside the home while the killings took place. Felix, who's being tried separately, has pleaded not guilty. Now, Fullerton police were alerted to the deaths when they received a call from the couple's six-year-old daughter who reported that her parents had died. Officers found the couple's six- and nine-year-old daughters, if I remember right, the ages, yeah, they were six and nine years old. They found them inside the home. They had not been harmed because, of course, this white trash piece of shit, Joshua Acosta, was determined to take those girls and sell them on the meat market to his military buddies. They also discovered the couple's 17-year-old daughter at that time was missing and at risk. She was later found and retrieved from white slavery in the hands of Acosta's military friends. She'd been sold to some high officers. Now Acosta told police he carried out the killings to protect Yoss, then 17-year-old daughter, Catlin Goodwill, who testified during the trial that Christopher Yost, her stepfather, had molested her on a daily basis when she was between the ages of 7 and 15. Acosta, the Army engineer, met the family and Felix in the Southern California furry community, a group of people who admire and dress up like animals at various meetups and at conventions. He was looking for a young girl to have furry sex with, and the parents had dressed her up in a dog collar, had trained her to eat and drink her water out of a dog bowl, piss like a bitch, and suck cock like a fiend. And she was rented out to this army guy, who later on wanted her entirely for himself. Because it's obviously hard to find a trained bitch on heels, other than one whose parents have brought her up as such. So, Caitlin Goodwill testified that on the night of the killings, she had planned to tell her mother about the sexual abuse from the father, 
who had been the one pimping her out, prostituting her. And she had to ask the primary client who seemed to have fallen in love with her, Acosta and his friend Felix, both of whom had had her, to help her run away. She testified she led Acosta into the home that night and waited in the truck with Felix. She has been granted immunity to testify in the case. Now, Acosta's attorney, Adam Vining, tried to paint this 17-year-old Caitlin Goodwill as the villainess during the trial, arguing that the teen wanted her mother and stepfather dead. He said, Acosta, who be autistic, be overly trusting, and had been manipulated. Well, the United States Army apparently didn't consider this autistic, white trash piece of subhuman shit to be so retarded that you couldn't put a fucking gun in his arm and send him out on a field to kill women and children in Iraq and Afghanistan. So when he came home and decided to fuck girls trained to be animals while he was dressed in a fucking shaggy suit himself, I mean, this is what we're fighting for, right? Your freedoms, right? This is what it's all about. Without the United States Army out there killing people overseas, you wouldn't be free back home to be doing this shit. Then he wanted that piece of leg off for himself. She wanted to get away from a dad who was fucking her every night. Now, a young lady like that in prison, they'd say she was trapped between a cock and a hard case. And this attorney tried to make her out to be the villainess. And you wonder why I hold white American culture and your military in such bloody sucking contempt. And that brings us to the case of Maria Butina, gun rights activist. Maria Butina, motherfucking Russian cunt, has become the first motherfucking Russian national convicted of conspiracy around the 2016 election after pleading guilty to working with a senior Russian official to infiltrate the conservative movement in the United States and render it reactionary. Maria Butina radicalized the Republican Party into Russophiliac insurgency. Made the red states motherfucking red. Serving motherfucking Russia to kill the rest of us in mass shootings. She's agreed to cooperate with prosecutors as she sits in federal prison. At this point, with the case of Maria Butina admitting she is a Russian terrorist who has come here to radicalize the Republican Party against the taxpaying electorate of the United States in state of war. In state of war. Per Vladimir Putin, this is war. How can any of you ass sucking bitches out there stand for this man? Stand by this man. Stand by the Republican Party. Stand by anything that calls itself conservative when it's all reactionary. When the independent parties are even worse. The libertarians, the worst of all. So in light of that, another update, because I won't let you forget. Remember November 7th. The aftermath of the mass shooting of the borderline bar and grill in Thousand Oaks was followed by calls for gun control, a familiar pattern these days in the United States. But California, my golden bear republic, the state nation, as opposed to a nation state, we are a state nation. We already have the nation's strictest gun control laws. So in Ventura County, Anti-firearm sentiment has turned elsewhere. Firearm shows. 
gun shows. The county's last gun show of the year be scheduled for this coming weekend at the Victoria County Fairgrounds. But even as this show moves forward, the board that oversees the state-owned fairgrounds is hesitating about what to do in 2019. So, of course, I'll keep you up to date on that. Now, the traitor, President Trump himself, has become increasingly isolated and be struggling to exert his influence as he enters what may be the most difficult stretch of his presidency, one laden with political and legal dangers. And this is no Adolf Hitler. This guy's got no ability to use the enemy's tactics and uh, create his own ordained counteroffensive. That stretches the war on, along with strategic bombing. In his case, of course, it's firestorms he's generating in my Golden Bear State. All because of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Donald Trump's presidential campaign being as extraordinarily successful as it has been. The former Federal Bureau of Investigations Director, Robert S. Mueller III, has racked up convictions or guilty pleas for several figures at the very top of the campaign, including one-time 2016 campaign chair Paul Manafort, Trump's former personal lawyer Michael Cohen, former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, senior campaign official Rick Gates, but most important of all, the cocksucking cunt Maria Butina, motherfucking Russian national, who now sits in federal prison, having confessed to the fact that she's here as a foreign terrorist, acting under orders of war, to convert an entire traitorous party, the Republicans, into a collaborationist occupation force over the United States on behalf of Vladimir Putin. So thanks to Robert S. Mueller III, a former Marine, mind you, Semper Fidelis. We know that Trump and Cohen discussed building a Trump Tower, Moscow, Trump Tower, Moscow, until far into the campaign that Cohen talked to a Russian official about it. We know they tried to meet Vladimir Putin in September 2015. We know from an investigation spun off from Mueller's office that Trump directed Cohen to commit campaign finance crimes by paying off women who say they had affairs with him. Findings like these would definitively have sunk other presidents. Yet the American public remains resoundingly unfussed. Mueller's own approval rating is polling at just 43%. He's beneath half. Because the people love Trump so much and what he represents. They want a pussy-grabbing rapist in the White House because that's what represents most white American men. Who dress up as furries and get their daughters to walk on all fours and suck cock and rain their ass. So they can rip them out to all their army buddies. Now, a couple of factors explain Mueller's low approval rating, aside from the obvious that I've just articulated. The first be Trump himself, for whom the bar be exceptionally low. Trump came to office loaded with baggage, which everyone could see, including multiple bankruptcies, decades of allegations of shady dealings, a known rapist, and probably someone who's had incestuous sex with his daughter. In fact, definitively so, because he pretty much admits to it. So Trump's messaging strategy has set monumentally high standards, on the other hand, for Mueller's investigation. The president has claimed in at least 20 tweets, I've stopped counting after 20, that Mueller doesn't have, quote-unquote, evidence of crimes committed by Donald John Trump. The circumstantial evidence of Donald Trump's wrongdoing be overwhelming, to say the least. Yet even Trump's opponents are now holding out for that smoking gun. You see, this is what my detractors, such as my primary gang stalker, the Aquino occultist, the multimillionaire, Stephen Outram, have done in my case, where they claim, oh, Douglas Dietrich 
has no evidence. Uh, I find no evidence for these claims on the internet. It's all bullshit. Of course, whenever you look up something I say, as my grandmistress Ramona Halitha Henry does when she provides these links constantly in thread of references to what I speak of, it's all there if you only look. But by claiming that someone can't find it when they look, then the idea is to discourage you from looking on your own because you believe someone's done it for you. Well, that's all a load of shit. Everything I say is true. Everything I say is self-evident, beyond which other evidence can be found. So when I speak, then what happens is no amount of evidence will do. As with the Trump cultists, no matter what Mueller finds, it will never do. So what's more, by repeatedly screaming, no collusion, Trump has painted the investigation as being about something that legal experts say isn't even a crime, rather than say his crime of obstruction of justice, among so many other things like treason, which is an executionable offense. And for that reason, Trump should be tried. And of course, application of the law should be done and justice delivered and found guilty. Trump should be executed. Hanged as you would a spy and a traitor. Now, the no collusion bullshit wouldn't be much of a defense in court, but chances are that Donald Trump won't have to defend himself in front of a judge. Justice Department policy be that the Constitution prohibits indicting sitting presidents, meaning that Trump's jury is Congress, lawmakers who base their views in large part on those of the American people. So while Trump's angry, repetitive tweeting into the abyss be contemptibly crass, the manner in which he has framed the debate could be what save his team. This is what my detractors and my gang stalkers also try to do, reframe everything I say as something it's not. So now this has been taken to the national level, and it's used against you on a daily basis to the point where your head's been stuffed so far up your own ass that you're swallowing your own shit, and it's poisoning your brain. And while you're choking on that chocolate, several people close to Trump are urging him to consider 39-year-old White House aide Johnny Stefano for his chief of staff after his top choice and others turned down the job. Also said to be in the running, his transgender son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Remember what I've told you. Jared Kushner has listed himself multiple times year after year on his voting documentation as a woman. He is transgender. He cannot have children. Ivanka's children are all from in vitro fertilization. And to yourself, if not, IVF was impregnated by her dad. Now there's a conspiracy for you that buggers anything in Pulp Fiction. Brings us to the war on Yemen, angry over the Khashoggi killing. The Senate demanded an end to the United States' role in the Yemen war and condemned Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. In a rebuke of Trump's response to Saudi Arabia's killing of Jamal Khashoggi, in which he defended Mohammed bin Salman, the man responsible for that torture assassination, and Trump's personal administration's stance on the ongoing war in Yemen also being rebuked by this action that I'm addressing as well as Saudi Arabia's involvement there in Yemen, the war. Therefore, the Republican-controlled Senate, mind you, invoked its war powers authority for the first time 
to demand a halt to the United States participation in the Saudi-led war in Yemen and end United States support for that war, directly challenging both Saudi Arabia and the Trump family dynasty. It was a rare enough step to find Donald Trump, which is a historic challenge given the decades-long robust partnership between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Except that it won't actually get the United States out of the war after a House maneuver. So what was the Senate hoping to achieve? The move was largely symbolic. Because Time's Person of the Year honors Jamal Kosoji and the Guardians of Truth. That would be me without acknowledgement. As well as others who have given their lives in the name thereof. It's a sign of our tumultuous times that Time Magazine has named journalists who risked their lives taking on despots and dysfunctional politicians, the guardians, as they use that term, in the war on truth, again their term, as its person of the year. And it's telling that half these people who comprise that person of the year being the journalist, the investigative journalist, the true journalist, not the fake newser, it's so telling that half the journalists in that category of true investigative journalism as honored by the person of the year aggregate have been murdered. It's the first time since Time Magazine launched the year-end feature back in 1927 the first time ever that some of the honorees be no longer alive to appreciate the acknowledgement. Even more striking, the largest number of these investigative journalists who died in the line of their profession were murdered in these United States. Murdered right here, motherfuckers. The United States now ranks as the fourth deadliest nation on earth for journalists. Tied with Mexico, where reporters have long been targeted by the drug cartels. The United States is now at the level of a drug cartel run shithole. Among those selected by Time Magazine on four separate covers, Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post columnist murdered by a Saudi hit squad in Istanbul, the staff of the Capital Gazette, the newspaper in Annapolis, Maryland, where a Trump cult gunman who had harassed the Gazette's journalists for years based on his alternative right conspiracies opened fire in that newsroom, killing five American journalists in their own home state their own home nation. The other journalists include Maria Raza, a former CNN bureau chief in Manila, who now heads Rappler, a news website that has tacked extrajudicial killings under Rodrigo Duterte, monitoring them, keeping track of how many. The president of the Philippines the dictator thereof, Rodrigo Duterte, has mass murdered an estimated 12,000 people in his war on drugs since he's entered office. And that's just what he officially admits to. This same Maria Reza, formerly of CNN, as a bureau chief in Manila, now faces trumped up charges from Rodrigo Duterte himself that carry a prison sentence of up to 10 years. An American sent to prison in a foreign land for reporting on one of Trump's friends. The fourth time cover goes to Wa Loan and Kwa Soyu, two Reuters journalists in Myanmar, formerly Burma, who were sentenced to seven years in prison for chronicling the grisly killing of 10 members of the Rohingya Muslim minority. The murderers whom they identified received 10-year sentences. 
they're getting only two or three years less. Time notes these are not the only heroic victims of the war on truth that was launched by Vladimir Putin and carried out by Donald Trump. It cites others among the 52 journalists murdered and over 250 reporters imprisoned worldwide this year. But the four journalists and one newspaper chosen to reflect a range of threats to the truth in the early 21st century. Time notes, this ought to be a time when democracy leaps forward and informs citizenry being essential to self-government. Instead, it's in retreat. Three decades after the Cold War defeat of a blunt and crude autocracy, a more clever brand takes nourishment from the murk that surrounds us. The old school despot embraced censorship. The modern despot, finding that more difficult, foments mistrust of credible fact itself, thrives on the confusion loosed by social media, and fashions the illusion of legitimacy from supplicants. In the United States, manipulation of the truth be now so integral to politics that the Washington Post announced this week that its barometer for falsehoods from one to four Pinocchios was no longer enough. It launched a new category, the bottomless Pinocchio. The Post website now has a separate page devoted just to bottomless liars. Per Glenn Kessler, the chief Washington Post fact checker, a politician needs to repeat a false claim at least 20 times before it ends up on the page. So far... There's only one name on it, President Donald John Trump. To quote his Kessler, President Trump has posed a unique challenge because unlike most politicians, he will continue to say things that are not true even after he has been fact-checked. We can't keep reprinting the fact-check, but we want to highlight these false statements in a way that calls attention to them and gives readers an easy-to-find reference guide. Trump has repeated the utter falsehood that his tax cut is the largest in history 123 times, that the economy during his presidency is the strongest ever 99 times, and that the border wall has been started 86 times. The full list of lies on the Post website be much longer. I couldn't repeat it all. Per Kessler, we hope it will be a disincentive to other politicians tempted to follow Trump's lead. Now, In terms of the economy, I'll address that as this transmission progresses. But sorting through the person of the year nominees, who ranged from Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin, in the most negative sense, to Christine Blasey Ford and the families separated at the border, on Tuesday, via NBC's Today Show, Ed Felsenthal, the editor of Time Magazine, said, It became clear that the manipulation and abuse of truth be really the common thread in so many of this year's major stories. For that same reason, Trump came in second as person of the year in the most negative sense as someone to condemn, and the special counsel, Robert Mueller, ranked third in the most positive sense. My bet, myself personally, Mueller will be times... Person of the Year in 2019. Kessler adds that the Guardians and Mueller are seeking the truth, whereas Trump destroys and distorts it. It's the yin and yang of our times. There has been fake news since humans learned to talk. But what we knew is that fake news and untruths can travel so much faster around the globe and people's understanding of the facts can be manipulated so easily. This increases the incentives for authoritarian regimes to crack down on reporters who expose the lies. That would be, of course, above and beyond any and all, simply because of my background enabling myself to do so. Douglas Dietrich. Now, Kessler notes the Buddhist riots and military crackdown against the Rohingya in Myanmar, the Muslims in Burma, were the result of misleading posts on Facebook. The government then went after the media, including the two Reuters correspondents who had exposed that Facebook had led to mass murder of Muslims. Courtney Rash, the advocacy director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, informs us that the number of journalists killed in 2018 is a 55% increase over last year. Aside from the five journalists who were killed in the United States, 13 others died in Afghanistan, 9 in Syria, and 5 in India, 
with smaller numbers also killed in Yemen, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Colombia, Israel. Yes, the Jews kill journalists too. And uh, the Palestinian territories, where journalists were murdered by Israeli forces. Libya, Nicaragua, Slovakia, Somalia, the Central African Republic, all have been where journalists have died. Investigating stories for you, instead of sitting down in front of a computer and sending out a bunch of fabricated bullshit, which all you people read on Facebook, and swallow like it's cotton candy. Now, Michael Abramovitz, the president of Freedom House and a former national editor at the Washington Post, tell us the Times election be particularly apropos in a year in which the free press be under greater threat than in any other period in living memory. The profound, growing threats to press freedom include government deployment of troll armies against critical voices, economic warfare against dissenting news outlets, and unremitting and scurrilous attacks by politicians on fact-based journalism as illegitimate or even fake news. These campaigns of vilification have helped pave the way to physical attacks against journalists, including murder. So Time's choice of Kosoji commenced two days after CNN reported the contents of a classified transcript of the Saudi journalist murder, which was recorded by Turkish intelligence and later provided to the United States and other Western governments. Kosoji's last words were, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. A few moments later, the tape recorded the sound of a bone saw at work, sawing his limbs off slowly for maximum pain. Unlike Yoakam Piper using his chainsaw to flick the fingers and wrists off of his young assassins who attacked him while he was at work in the yard, these guys weren't doing anything in terms of self-defense. The torture squad sent in to take care of Asoji made him suffer every moment that he was breathing. He stopped himself from breathing so he would stop suffering. The Turkish government claims that the saw was brought in by a 15-member hit squad to dismember Kasoji's body, not just to torture him, but so that they could put it in a bucket which they buried out in the backyard of the embassy. So much fertilizer. The forensic scientist, who was a member of the team, is actually heard advising the others to listen to music through their headphones if the bone saw sounds bothered them. Poor babies. They had a forensic scientist with them, a coroner, who specialized not just in autopsies, but in dissecting people alive. He told the other guys to listen to music while his saw went through bone cracked through that, then you heard the marrow. There's that kind of resistance when you put the bone drill through the skull. Then it plows through, gets into the brain. The murder of Kasoji, who had dared to criticize the headstrong Saudi crowd prince, Mohammed bin Salman, for his aggressive policies at home and all across the Middle East, reflects the pivotal role of the press and its vulnerability. Kasoji's killing has had a rippling impact that almost certainly would have surprised himself. It's led to the deepest challenge to United States-Saudi relations since they were first cemented by the other Stalinist stooge who served Joseph Stalin in the same way that Donald Trump serves Vladimir Putin, a certain Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he bowed down to the King Ibn Saud on his flagship, the Quincy, And King Ibn Saud, the founder of the modern kingdom of the House of Saud in the 1940s, brought on his flock of sheep, saying that Franklin Roosevelt's servicemen would be welcome to fuck them so they would not violate any of their pure Muslim women. This must be why so many of the GIs got into the furry. And how that Acosta motherfucker wound up fucking a furry's daughter. On a collar. Now, 
needs to be emphasized that Kasoji's body has not been found since they sawed it into any number of fish pieces. And Mohammed bin Salman, as the crown prince be known, MBS actually, he's known by his initials, like he was a, you know, a debutante or some shit. MBS has faced no consequences whatsoever at home or from allied governments. Earlier this month, he was photographed with the heads of government from the world's 19 other major economies, including Donald John Trump. But last week, after a Central Intelligence Agency briefing about Kosoji's murder, the Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina said, There's not a smoking gun, there's a smoking saw. You have to be willfully blind not to come to the conclusion that this was orchestrated and organized by people under the direct command of MBS and that he was involved personally in the demise of Mr. Kosoji. The Republican Bob Corker of Tennessee, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, predicted if the Crown Prince went in front of a jury, he would be convicted in 30 minutes. Instead, 18 other Saudis have been detained. The Kingdom of Saud has not even released their names. In the past year, the number of journalists detained has also set a record. Ratch, of the Committee to Protect Journalists, has exposed this. Most have been arrested on charges of criticizing the state, many for allegedly reporting false news. Turkey, China, and Egypt account for more than half the arrests worldwide. More than a dozen journalists were detained in Saudi Arabia alone. Now, Ratch the lady who leads the committee to protect journalists. To quote a she, journalists have been caught in the crosshairs amid the global rise in elitism. She calls it populism. It's not populism. The majority of the United States doesn't buy into this shit at all. It's only the most retarded and stupidest, the most vicious and petty, the most vile among us, the proudly ignorant, the uneducated, the illiterate. That's not populism. That's elitism. It's the elite of the bottom of the line. The people at the bottom of the barrel want to be at the top. And they have their own brand of elitism based on skin color, based on birth, by dint of birthright of having been born on the soil of the United States. They consider themselves citizens, but they want to deprive that of people who are black, who have been born on the soil of the United States, because they were originally brought over from across the Atlantic as slaves, as if the whites didn't come here from across the Atlantic. Elitism. The delegitimization of democracy and its foundational principles of press freedom and the ongoing global war against terrorism and extremism in which journalism be so oft equated with terrorism. The Time magazine cover gives well-deserved credit to the media at a time when it be besieged by claims of fake news. The problem be that it doesn't change the challenges of winning the war for truth. This is where I myself be always shaking my head aloud. Journalists working as fact-checkers for Facebook have pushed to end a controversial media partnership with that social network, saying that the company has ignored their concerns and failed to use their expertise to combat misinformation. Facebook advertised for fake news fact-checkers, but they don't care. Facebook fact-checking is in disarray as journalists have pushed to cut ties. The journalists paid to help fix Facebook's fake news problem, and they say they've lost trust in the platform. So, Journalists working as fact checkers for Facebook, they pushed to end this partnership with the social network, saying that the company has ignored their concerns, failed to use their expertise to combat misinformation at all. Current and former Facebook fact checkers, they told The Guardian that the tech platform's collaboration with outside reporters has produced minimal results and that they've lost trust in Facebook, which has repeatedly refused to release meaningful data about the impacts of their work. Some said Facebook's hiring a public relations firm that used a Judeophobic narrative to discredit critics fuels the same kind of propaganda fact checkers regularly debunk. And it should be a deal breaker. Brooke Binkowski, former managing editor of Snopes, a fact checking site that has partnered with Facebook for two years, she says they've essentially used us, meaning her and other fact checkers, for PR, for crisis PR as they call it. Damage control. They're not taking anything seriously. They're more interested in making themselves look good and passing the buck. They clearly don't care. 
Facebook began building its partnerships with news outlets after the 2016 presidential election, during which fake stories and political propaganda reached hundreds of millions of users on the Facebook platform. The goal was to rely on journalists to flag false news and limited spread, but research and anecdotal evidence have repeatedly suggested that the debunking work has struggled to make a difference. In failure, Facebook now has over 40 40 media partners across the globe, including the Associated Press, PolitiFact, the Weekly Standard, and all have said that false news on the platform is, quote-unquote, trending downward. Now, while some newsroom leaders say that the relationship was positive, if that truly be the result, other partners said the results are entirely unclear, and they've grown increasingly resentful of Facebook, especially following revelations that the company had paid a consulting firm to go after opponents by publicizing their association with billionaire Jewish philanthropist George Soros. And the attacks fed into a well-known conspiracy theory about Soros being the hidden hand behind all manner of liberal causes and global events. They turned Soros into what I know Michael Aquino to be. So it was later revealed that Sheryl Sandberg, Chief Operating Officer had directed her staff to research Soros' financial interests after he publicly criticized the company of Facebook. And that's when Paul Zuckerberg gave her the order, he's a Jew, but I'm a kike. And you serve me, and I want you to condemn him and the entire Jewish race. Because as a race traitorous kike, my own empire comes above all of Judaism. Now, a journalist and current Facebook fact checker who was not authorized to speak publicly about the news outlet's partnership, but who has advocated for an end for, to that partnership nonetheless, has been quoted as saying, why should we trust Facebook when it's pushing the same rumors that its own fact checkers are calling fake news? It's worth asking, how do they treat stories about George Soros on the platform, knowing they specifically pay people to try to link political enemies to him. Working with Facebook makes us all look bad. Another fact checker who's long worked on the Facebook partnership said they were demoralized, confessing they'd be a terrible company. And on a personal level, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Now, Binkowski, who left Snopes earlier this year and now runs her own fact checking site, which does not partner with Facebook, said the Facebook Snopes partnership quickly became counterproductive. During early conversations with Facebook, Pinkowski said she tried to raise concerns about misuse of the platform abroad, such as the explosion of hate speech and misinformation during the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar, leading to Muslim genocide, and other violent propaganda, leading to genocide of gays in Uganda, etc., etc. Pinkowski, who previously reported on immigration and refugees, said Facebook largely ignored her. So, to quote a she, I was bringing up Myanmar over and over and over. They were absolutely resistant. I strongly believe that they'd be spreading fake news on behalf of hostile foreign powers and authoritarian governments as the foundation of their business model. In other words, Facebook is a platform of pure treason. It was established by Mark Zuckerberg, he being the international Jew, the very international crypto Jew that he decries George Soros to be, so that he could help Russia overcome and occupy the United States. King LaCapria recently left Snopes as a content manager and fact checker, partly due to her frustrations with the Facebook arrangement. She said it quickly seemed clear that Facebook wanted the appearance of trying to prevent damage without actually doing anything, and that she was particularly upset to learn that Facebook was paying Snopes. That felt really gross. Facebook has one mission, and fact-checking websites should have a completely different mission. Now, Pinkowski says that on at least one occasion it appeared that Facebook was pushing reporters to prioritize debunking misinformation that affected Facebook advertisers, which she thought crossed the line. You're not doing journalism anymore. You're doing propaganda. Now, a Facebook spokesperson repeatedly declined to comment on whether advertisers influence fact-checking at all communicating to myself in an email that the primary way we surface potentially false news to third-party fact-checkers be via machine learning. 
Now, after my querying, however, Facebook has since published a blog post saying it does not ask partners to prioritize fact checks related to advertisers. At other times, Snopes ended up fact checking satirical articles from Facebook, which felt like a waste of time and in certain instances sparked intense backlash against Snopes. Now, once Snopes became an official partner, there was also a noticeable increase in online harassment, death threats, and attacks from far-right users and prominent so-called conservatives, it is reactionaries, who accused the fact-checkers and Facebook of having left-wing bias and agenda. Now, this was all confirmed by myself by Bukinski. Uh, Binkowski, forgive me. I uh, slurred. And uh, I, I know that this is all part of play in the ref. The strategy of which I articulated in one of my more recent transmissions. So when you're checking out the videos we published, you might hear it, but it's probably been more recent than that. So you'll probably find it by subscribing and then accessing videos you wouldn't get until published. So that forces you to subscribe to Douglas Teacher channel. Now when reporters got caught in these kinds of firestorms, Cyberstorms. Facebook let individual journalists shoulder the blame, throwing them under the bus at every opportunity. They were just collateral damage. A Facebook representative has told myself that it's begun incorporating journalist safety training for new partners. Now, think about what I'm fucking saying. Safety training for Facebook fact checkers? That just goes to show you when you say Donald Trump's telling a lie, Vladimir Putin is telling a lie, that you're going to get bomb threats, rape threats, death threats on a daily basis, and you're going to have to take safety training because people are going to try to fucking kill you. Now, LaCapria, who's now working with Binkowski on her new site, said it became difficult to report on Facebook and Snopes due to the financial arrangement. We knew that if anything involved on Facebook, it was at risk of being compromised. So, per one current fact checker, most of us feel it's more trouble than it's worth. So, Facebook said that third-party fact checking be one part of its strategy to fight misinformation and has claimed that a false rating leads an article to be ranked lower in news feed, reducing future views by 80% on average. The companies refused, however, to publicly release any data to support these claims. One current fact checker said the process overall was too slow and that off the fact checks came too late by the time it gets to us, how many people have already seen it? In contrast, Angie Drobnich Holen, editor of PolitiFact, said the partnership was a public service, that Facebook was helping them identify questionable material. And she said the revenue from Facebook added to their overall sustainability. So someone's making money off this at least. Now, as to if uh, the impacts, the impacts of her site's work, she said, is it reducing fake content on Facebook? I don't know. I can't tell. Can Facebook tell? You would assume they could. I don't have any way of knowing. So what she's saying is she doesn't fucking care. Just like Facebook. And Facebook said in a statement that it had heard feedback from our partners that they'd like more data on the impact of their efforts adding that it was started sending quarterly reports with customized statistics to partners and would be looking for more statistics to share externally in early 2019. Now, Facebook's declined to share any of those reports with myself, I'll have you know. But according to Holin, who said Facebook st stated uh, documents must remain private once they be produced, PolitiFact, I know for a fact, hasn't received any reports either. So, Snopes' founder and CEO, David Nicholson, said he was unaware of any quarterly reports at all. And in an interview that uh, I was able to find, he also said he didn't share Binkowski's concerns about the Facebook partnerships that he felt it had a minimal impact on how Snopes operates, uh, claiming our work remains the same, adding that he did not expect Facebook to share data on how Snopes' work be affecting other publishers. It's up to Facebook to decide the relative success of it. So... All of this is what has brought about a Facebook fake news inquiry.
And you've got entire nation states now demanding answers. Not just people in different nation states. You have entire nation states as represented by their legitimate governments. Legislators from Argentina to Ireland feel Facebook has failed to get a grip on the issue, and they're ready to step in. Legislators from around the world gathered in London for the International Grand Committee session on fake news, led by the United Kingdom's Damien Collins as chair of the Digital, Culture, Media, and Sports Select Committee. Representatives from nine nations were grilling Richard Allen, Facebook's vice president of policy solutions, on Tuesday at the House of Commons. Mm. Now, here be what each country had questions for Facebook to answer. I'll start with Ireland. The Irish government be reviewing proposed legislation to promote online safety amid outcry that tech companies be unwilling or unable to tackle harmful content. The move draws with Dublin's nominally effusive support for tech companies with an Irish base. Facebook has its European headquarters in Dublin and falls under the remit of Irish data protection authorities. Hildegard Norton, uh, Fine Gael TV, or Member of Parliament, in Gaelic, who chairs a Joint Committee on Communications, Climate Action and Environment, has said the time for apologies and remedial action from the Facebook company has passed. In August, she said, social media platforms have shown themselves incapable of self-regulation. If they won't regulate themselves, we must do it for them. Here, here. Now, hmm. Irish lawmakers summoned Facebook executives, including Joel Kaplan, Vice President of Global Policy, to the Daya in August after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. He apologized for privacy breaches and other violations and said Facebook would expand a pilot of a tool to increase transparency around adverts before Ireland's abortion referendum. The broadcaster RTE complained after a paid-for post mimicked an RTE news report. Lawmakers also expressed alarm after a Channel 4 dispatches documentary showed instructors from CPL Resources, a Dublin-based Facebook contractor, telling moderators to leave extreme content on the site. Not no be at the fake news inquiry alongside Eamon Ryan, a Green Party TD and former communications minister who has criticized Facebook's privacy breaches. There's been unusual cross-party support for a bill sponsored by Backbench, Sinn Féin, TD, uh, I believe the name is Don Shad O. Lauguer, and this individual wants to appoint a digital safety commissioner. Now, all that's commendable, and right across that tiny little sliver of water in which sits the Isle of Man is, of course, Greater Britain. And Facebook's fight in the United Kingdom has turned from whether the company will face regulation to what form that'll take. Even before the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke, Matt Hancock, then the culture secretary, was discussing the need for regulation, calling for rules for tech to be harnessed for the good of the people. Since then, those plans have only intensified. The initial focus of such regulation was online safety, particularly when they focus on protecting children on the Internet. In May, Hancock announced new laws would be created to make sure the United Kingdom be the safest place in the world to be online. Tackling issues from cyberbullying to online child sexual exploitation. Now, Collins and the select committee have succeeded in opening up another flank on which Facebook may face stricter controls by subjecting the company's representatives to harsh questioning over both efforts to fight misinformation and data protection issues, and a loose consensus be forming in Parliament and parts of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport that the British media regulator, Ofcom, needs powers to deal with some of those issues rather than being limited to only engaging with traditional broadcasters. Sharon White, the regulator's chief executive, told Collins Committee last month that one approach would be to ensure that Facebook and others like it have systems, processes, and governance in place so that the country can be satisfied that the harms are being addressed in a consistent and effective manner. 
Now, such a regulation is unlikely to surface in the short term as Brexit is taking all of Parliament's time. But in the mid to long term, the government hopes that the freedom to enact laws that go beyond what the European Union allows could set Britain up as a beacon for enlightened regulation of the Internet in a way that encourages others to follow its lead. This is why we in the United States have to follow that lead and eliminate the First Amendment, which they don't have in Britain at all. And then we will work towards a safer world in which men with guns are being talked into using them for mass murder by men with words. And that brings us to Canada. Canada, of course, has laws that will put you in jail for denying the Holocaust, of the Jews at least. And Canada's parliament and the country's privacy commissioner will be continuing to investigate data breaches by Facebook after the company admitted it exposed the personal information of well over 600,000 Canadian users. While Facebook Canada officials were grilled by parliamentarians in April, Mark Zuckerberg has twice refused requests to appear. Bob Zimmer, chair of the Parliament's Access to Information, Privacy and Ethics Committee, told reporters, what we want to hear from Mark Zuckerberg directly is his response to the data breaches in Canada and also the response to how they're going to handle fake news in the future. He said the government be deeply concerned about the effect Facebook has on democracy and the extensive control it has over data and advertising. In September, the privacy commissioner said it would investigate Facebook over the harvesting of user data. In a statement, the commissioner, Daniel Tarian, said the digital world and social media in particular have become entrenched in our daily lives and people want their rights to be respected. While fact checkers hired by Facebook began working in Canada over the summer, top officials still fear fake news has not yet been reined in. This month, the defense minister... Harjit Sajjan warned that Canada was a likely target for misinformation campaigns spread through social media in the run-up to the 2019 federal election. He told the Canadian Press News Agency, we need to further educate our citizens about the impact of fake news. No one wants to be duped by anybody. Well, that brings us to Australia. They've been duped by the ANZUS Pact Treaty for like, what, fucking 50 or 60 years by now? Although Australia doesn't have a representative to grill Facebook in London, didn't certainly, none was there from Australia on Tuesday, Australia's competition regulator be investigating Facebook's impact on competition in media and advertising alongside that of Google and content aggregators such as Apple News. Now, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has said the slump in public interest journalism may be contributing to a more partisan culture of debate, as well as an increase in the circulation of misleading news stories and the existence of online echo chambers. Now, the ACCC chairman, Rod Sims, believe the survival of quality journalism in the face of digital giants such as Facebook be a defining issue of our age and says quality investigative journalism be highly valued in Australian society. Now, News Corp Australia has told the ACC's inquiry that Facebook's refusal to take responsibility for or moderate the content that appears on the platform has given rise to a proliferation of fake news. News Corp, in its submission, said, alarmingly, the phenomenon of fake news appears to be growing with no clear oversight as to how it can be managed. So Facebook has told the commission that most fake news be financially motivated and that it's improving through detection uh, of new, uh, by new tools and working with third parties to raise awareness of reliable sources. Well, I can tell you what they're saying, because I know that the ladies I know who worked as fact checkers for Facebook have said it, go straight to Douglas Dietrich as your primary source of, quote unquote, reliable news. He is the most preeminent and reliable of sources. But Facebook hasn't listened. I mean, that brings us to Singapore. Singapore's strict laws mean the government keeps a tight control over the media and there be no real free press. 
That's what makes Singapore one of the blessed, most blessed, best places on earth to live. Now, in March, a government survey found that 46% of people came across fake news on Facebook. In response, a parliamentary committee began investigating whether Singapore should ban fake news, and in September it concluded that tech companies giving a platform to falsehoods should be subject to legislation. However, many be concerned a new law will just be used to further curb freedom of expression. And executives from Google and Facebook have urged the Parliamentary Committee to not go ahead with the law. I'm happy to say that it hasn't died. The frictions continued this month when Facebook rejected a Singapore government request to remove an online article that the government said was false and malicious. Now, that article was written by an Australian blogger alleging that Singaporean banks were involved in the 1MDB global corruption scandal. Facebook said it did not have a policy to deal with taking down alleged falsehoods unless they directly incited violence. Well, I know pretty much the majority of people on earth would kill for money. Now, in Argentina, that nation's national uh, electoral chamber, which is in the Espanol acronymous as CNE, is seeking to reduce the impact of fake news on the presidential elections that were held already and the ones that are to be held in October this year, or October of 2019, excuse me. Now, the importance of stricter controls be underlined by the fact that Argentina's political parties have raised their investment in social media from 4.7% of total campaigning spending in 2011, the year my late and sainted Cyrus died, to 31% in last year's midterms. That's according to a recent CNE report that I sourced. Now, when announcing that the measures will include the publication of web monitoring of last year's elections, CNE Secretary Hernan Goncalves figure where at Figueredo, 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 I believe her name is, Figueredo. Um, now, Ernan was saying, we've detected social media accounts that jump from 200 to 2,000 daily interactions. It could be the result of troll farms or bots so that anyone can see how the political parties or candidates behaved on the web during any given election. The CNE also be creating a registry of official party websites and social media accounts so that anyone who wishes to can verify the source of the information. There will also be representatives from Brazil, France, Belgium, and Latvia at the query. Now, all of this, of course, brings us to Huawei executive Ming Wang Zhao being released on bail Tuesday of uh, last week. And of course, the United States accuses Huawei, the tech giant, of using a Hong Kong shell company to deceive banks and do business with Iran in violation of United States sanctions. But China earlier warned of unspecified dire consequences if Ming was not released. So the editor-in-chief of the Global Times that's a Chinese Communist Party-run tabloid known for its provocative views, warned in a video Wednesday night of retaliatory measures if Canada doesn't free Ming. So Hu Jijin, speaking in English, said, if Canada extradites Ming to the United States, China's revenge will be far worse than detaining a Canadian. Now, a second Canadian man has been detained in China already, raising the stakes in the dispute over this Huawei executive arrested in Canada, held for extradition to the United States. Now, by saying he might intervene in the case of Huawei executive Ming Wang Zhao, did the president throw Canada under the bus? China confirmed Thursday that it has detained two Canadian men raising the stakes in a three-way dispute over the Chinese technology executive facing possible extradition for Canada to the United States. 
the foreign ministry spokesman, Liu Kang, said that entrepreneur Michael Spavor and former diplomat Michael Kovrig were taken into custody prior Monday, I believe, of last week on suspicion of engaging in activities that endanger the national security of China. So Lu was insinuating that Canada was informed, but declined to say whether the men had been provided with lawyers. He said the cases are being handled separately by local bureaus of the National Intelligence Agency in Beijing, where Kovrig was picked up, and the northeastern city of Dandong, where Spavor lived. Now, at a daily briefing, Lu told reporters, the legal rights of the two Canadians are being safeguarded. Now, the two cases ratchet up pressure on Canada, which beholden Ming Wenzhou, the chief financial officer of Huawei Technologies Limited. She was arrested December 1st at the request of the United States, which wants her extradited to face bank fraud charges. Despite the escalating frictions resulting from the tension, Trade talks between Beijing and the Trump administration remain ongoing. The two sides have taken pains this week to emphasize that their trade talks be entirely separate from the United States case against Ming and any retaliatory moves by Beijing. Now, Canadian officials have been unable to contact Spaver since he let it be known he was being questioned by Chinese authorities. So... That brings us, of course, to the Canadian Global Affairs spokesman, William Baru, who says we're working very hard to ascertain his whereabouts, and we continue to raise this with the Chinese government. Now, Kovrig was the guy I remember them taking in, and he's an analyst on Northeast Asia for the International Crisis Group, a think tank who took a leave of absence from the Canadian government. He lives in Hong Kong. Spavor runs tours of North Korea along with sports, business, and other exchanges through his company, Pick to Cultural Exchange. He's met with leader Kim Jong-un, was instrumental in bringing about the former NBA star Dennis Rodman to the North Capitol, and he's, um, if I remember correctly, that was at Pyongyang in 19, no, 2013. That was at Pyongyang in 2013. So acquaintances said Spavor was due Monday in Seoul, the South Korean capital, but failed to arrive. So these detentions show that another Canadian as well, Kevin Garrett, who was picked up in 2014 in what was seen as a retaliation for Canada's arrest of a Chinese spying suspect wanted in the United States. Garrett was held for 750 days, 2014 to 2016, sentenced to eight years in prison on spying charges, but then deported. So the broadly defined national security charge against Huawei encompasses both traditional espionage and other forms of information gathering, such as interviewing dissidents uh, and contacting non-governmental organizations. So a senior Canadian official has told reporters that Canada has asked China for extra security at its embassy because of protests and anti-Canadian sentiment since uh, the chief executive officer, uh, this uh, enabler of Huawei, the daughter, uh, since she was taken capture, you know, and taken prisoner. So um, in terms of uh, this, the um, situation where you've got all of this result in a kind of uh, gray area, uh, so many gray areas, then the only thing we can count on is ultimately trust and resumption of dialogue. And the United States and China are both trying to emphasize that trade talks be separate from Maine's case. But then President Donald Trump said Tuesday he would intervene if it helped produce a deal. So Trump told reporters in an interview If I think it's good for what will be certainly the largest trade deal ever made, which be a very important thing, what's good for national security, I would clearly intervene if I thought it was necessary. So the suggestion that Maine could be a political pawn makes the situation more awkward for Canada. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau bristled 
at Trump's assertion, saying, regardless of what goes on in other countries, Canada is and will always remain a country of the rule of law. So Foreign Minister Christia Freeland said it was quite obvious any foreign country requesting extradition should ensure the process be not politicized. Now, Gregory Yeager of the Struke Law Firm, a former Justice Department attorney himself, has said that Trump's remarks could be interpreted as creating the appearance at the arrest also had political motivations. This could undermine the United States' reputation as a nation that follows the rule of law and could ultimately undermine both the main prosecution and the trade talks. Now, earlier this year, Trump threw fire for intervening on behalf of Huawei's smaller Chinese rival, ZTE Corp., after that company was barred from buying United States technology over exports to Iran and North Korea. Now, Trump restored assets after ZTE agreed to pay a $1 billion United States dollar fine, change its board and executives, and install a team of U.S. selected compliance managers. So Trump performed a hostile takeover after a company essentially became uh, an enemy. But did Trump throw Canada under the bus? Because after days of angry protests from Chinese officials over the arrest in Canada of Huawei executive Ming Wenzhou and explanations from Canadian and U.S. officials that this was not a political stunt, just a matter of legal process, Trump upended the entire conversation Tuesday when he said that the criminal case against the daughter of one of China's wealthiest tech billionaires had become or could become a bargaining chip in trading war negotiations. So to some, Trump seems to have handed the Chinese a major propaganda post by suggesting what Beijing has argued all along, that Ming's arrest was political. Others took uh, Trump's comment as confirmation that Ming was being used as a hostage in the trade talks to exert pressure on China. So Chinese officials have drawn a particularly tough line, saying Canada would face serious consequences if Ming, who was arrested at Washington's request, wasn't free. On Tuesday, Ming was released on bail, but must remain in Vancouver in one of, the, of her two homes there. Canada, meanwhile, said that it had merely followed its legal obligations and uh, that it was, uh, how would I say it? They're trying to process the United States' extradition request, even if they damage their own interests. Now, China state-owned Global Times mocked Canada on Wednesday for just that reason, because it sounds so ridiculously silly. China mocked Canada as a province awaiting marching orders from its powerful neighbor to the south. So they treated it the way that all of China was treated by the Roosevelt uh, administration and later by the Truman administration as some trap, satrap that's just waiting to be conquered by its more powerful neighbor. In the case of China, it was supposed to be the Russians, the Slavs. And in the case of America, it would be the Republicans on behalf of the Republican Party and Vladimir Putin. So when you try to analyze Trump's statement about intervention, it could be seen as a sign that China's furious reaction to Meng's arrest achieved the desired result and should be considered a useful tactic in the future. But it might also have a chilling effect on nations like Canada when they be asked to carry out the United States' legal moves abroad. Now, Roland Paris, a former foreign policy advisor to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, called Trump's comments troubling. So I have his tweet and another guy's tweet, uh, which I'll source now. Uh, in the case of uh, the uh, Paris tweet, he says, Canada is 
acting in good faith, according to the law, in response to a U.S. extradition request, Canada is fulfilling the terms of its treaty obligations and upholding the rule of law in good faith and paying a price to do so. If the United States be not equally committed to the rule of law in this case, the extradition request should be withdrawn immediately. Now, former Canadian ambassador to China, David Mulroney, said it was concerning that both China and the United States were willing to ignore the rule of law. So he described Trump as a discordant voice, the catalyst for such. Mulroney tweeted the following, that the leaders of both China and the United States fail to respect the rule of law be worrying and discouraging. But in the case of the United States, Trump be simply a discordant voice. We need to stay focused on doing the right thing and get used to navigating on our own. Well, I can't argue with that. So Canada canceled a trade delegation trip to China on Monday over fears of repercussions, sourcing, of course, from Ming's arrest. The same day, former Canadian diplomat Michael Coffrey was detained by the Beijing Bureau of State Security. That's according to his employer, the International Crisis Group. And boy, have they got an international crisis on their hands now. The Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs said Kovrig's employers had broken the law by failing to register as a non-governmental organization. So they're grasping at straws. And Jorge Guajardo, a former Mexican ambassador to Beijing, said Trump's comments could make countries think twice about helping the United States pursue justice abroad at all. Now, to quote as he, Jorge Guajardo, he says, by President Trump implying that he may use this for bargaining power, even if he wasn't able to use her in that capacity, the mere fact that he implies it leaves Canada in a very poor position, especially after we've seen how China has reacted to Canada. Now, Wahardo said Trump, whether he intended to or not, had sent a loud message to the world. So, basically, per the observations of Wahardo, he puts it this way. I think it puts the United States in a very weak position. It hurts its message all over the world. It hurts its effort. And it puts Americans all over the world at risk because then they can be used as pawns in his political trading games. So it's for that reason that Lynette Ong, a science professor at Toronto University and an expert on China, said Trump's comments damage both Canada and the United States. So to quote a she, she says the Chinese reaction to Meng's address has always been that it was politically motivated, the arrest of Meng Wenzhou. And now those statements by Trump just fuel that belief. Now, Liu Kang, not the Mortal Kombat victim or villain, he's a Chinese foreign ministry official. He welcomed Trump's remarks. At a Tuesday press briefing, Liu said any person, especially if it be a leader of the United States or a high-level figure, who'd be willing to make positive efforts to push this situation towards the correct direction, then that, of course, deserves to be well-received. And he called Meng's arrest a mistake from the start and reiterated deals on Canada and the United States to release her immediately. Meng was released on bail later that very Tuesday. So obviously, the Chinese got what they wanted to extent. Now, if convicted in the United States for fraud related to breaches of U.S. sanctions on Iran, the basis for her arrest, Ming could face up to 30 years in prison. Now, in the Reuters interview, Trump said he wanted to see what China had to say before making a decision on Ming's extradition, a signal that he regarded the case not as a matter for the courts, but as a political opportunity. He said, so I want to see what China requests. So far, they have not made that request. Now, Trump's comments mark the second time in a year that he's shown a willingness to use American sanctions as leverage chips in a trade war 
with America's biggest geopolitical rival, communist China. Now, earlier this year, Trump sent a message to China that he was going to intervene to rescue powerful Chinese firms from the legal consequences of breaching American trade sanctions on countries like Iran or North Korea. So, the arrests of Ming and Kovrig come at a time of rising global competition between the United States and China and strategic rivalry in high-tech fields like robotics, superconductors, and artificial intelligence, heightening the fears that American business people or companies could be targeted by Chinese officials should trade relations deteriorate. Now, the United States and China have 90 days to negotiate a comprehensive deal to end a bruising trade war that has seen both sides slap tariffs on billions of dollars in goods. The conflicts cut business in both China and the United States and could slow economic growth. Now, Trump was characteristically vague on how he might intervene in Ming's extradition or how her case could influence trade talks. His comments also contradicted U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, who said Sunday that the extension or the extradition case was totally separate from trade talks. So on CBS's Face the Nation, Lighthizer said, this is a criminal justice matter. It's only separate from anything I work on or anything that trade policy people in the administration work on. The Trump administration has long since complained of China's ignoring global rules and using underhanded tactics of outright theft to abolish American technical secrets and intellectual property. But if Trump be willing to brush aside conventions on judicial independence in cases against major Chinese companies or their executives, it could leave China more, not less, likely to do the same in the future according to analysts. So asked whether Meng could potentially be cleared, Trump said, well, it's possible that a lot of different things could happen, but it's also possible that will be part of negotiations. But we'll speak to the Justice Department, we'll speak to them, we'll get a lot of people involved. So Meng Wenzhou, the daughter of Huawei founder Ren Jingfei, one of China's most prominent tech figures, offered her appreciation on social media after she was freed on seven and a half million United States dollars bail and surrendered her passport. She said, I'm in Vancouver by my family's side. I'm proud of Huawei and proud of my home country. Thanks to everyone who's been concerned about me. And Chinese officials, of course, have offered no details since Wednesday on Cold Freak's whereabouts. So no one knows where he went or why he talks as he does, meaning he mostly speaks in the Hebrew language. Now, what also happened last weekend was something I never thought I'd see. I predicted that the Medicare fight must be over. I sprack it too soon. And uh, a federal judge in Texas declared the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional on Friday, issuing a blockbuster ruling that threatens to throw insurance markets into chaos and strip health coverage from tens of millions of patients nationwide. There's a group of left-leaning states led by my own Golden Bear Republic of California that's stepped up to defend the health care law quickly, saying they'll appeal. So... Let me try and articulate what's at risk in the Texas Obama ruling. Whether you know it or not, Obamacare has affected nearly every American. The Affordable Care Act does far more than allow millions of people to get health insurance through exchanges or Medicaid expansion. It saves senior citizens money on their Medicare coverage and prescription drugs. It lets many Americans obtain free birth control, mammograms, cholesterol tests. It requires many restaurants to post the calorie counts of their menu items. 
and it allows children to stay on their parents' health insurance plans until they turn 26. Even the Trump administration is using the landmark health reform law to try to lower prescription drug prices. And most importantly for many people, Obamacare prevents insurers from turning away or charging more to those with pre-existing conditions. Now, this provision proves so popular that even Republican candidates found themselves promising to defend it in the recent midterm election in an unsuccessful bid to retain their majority in the House. So some 52 million people, or 27% of non-elderly adults, have a pre-existing condition that would have prevented them from getting coverage prior to Obamacare, and that's according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. So Larry Levitt, the founder's senior vice president, said of the Affordable Care Act, you'd be hard-pressed to find a part of the health care system that was not touched by the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. Now, all this, however, can be swept away by a U.S. District Court judge in Texas who ruled Friday that the Affordable Care Act's individual coverage mandate be unconstitutional and that the rest of the law, therefore, cannot stand. He claims it seeks to accomplish what Republicans have tried to do for years, repeal Obamacare. Now, the decision which be expected to be appealed by all my groups, doesn't immediately affect Americans' coverage. But if it's upheld by higher courts, it could turn back the clock on the nation's health care system to before Obamacare became the rule of law, the law of the land in 2010, when the uninsured rate for nine elderly adults was 18.2%. It's now only 10.3%. Now, here's what's at risk. Medicare, Obamacare, has meant lower premiums, deductibles, cost sharing for roughly 60 million senior citizens and disabled Americans enrolled in the program. The health reform law made many changes to Medicare. It slowed the growth of payment rates to hospitals and other providers reduce payments to Medicare Advantage plans, and improve benefits for employees. The Obama administration estimated that the typical beneficiary, the medical beneficiary, pays about $700 less in premiums and cost sharing thanks to the Affordable Care Act. Now, under Obamacare, Medicare enrollees also receive free preventative benefits, such as screenings for breast and colorectal cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. And Obamacare helped close the gap in Medicare's drug coverage and was on track to completely eliminate it by 2020. Senior citizens, it's got to be remembered, have to pay more for drugs while they're in the donut hole. Hmm which lies between the initial coverage and catastrophic coverage phases. The Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 accelerated the closing of the collection gap to 2019. Now, all that, but still, Obamacare does mean higher costs for more affluent beneficiaries. The law froze the threshold for the Medicare premium surcharge at $85,000 United States dollars for individuals and $170,000 United States dollars for couples. So so more people have become subject to it. Now, the Affordable Care Act also added a premium surcharge on drug coverage for high-income enrollees. So... This brings us to the concept of employer-sponsored insurance. Obamacare requires that companies with at least 50 employees provide affordable housing to their staffers 
uh, who work for over 30 hours a week. Now, the mandate didn't have a major impact on the 150 million voters who are insured through the jobs. Most larger employers already offer coverage for full-time workers. However, setting the bar at 30 hours a week prompted some employers to extend coverage to more of their staff, since many companies had considered that threshold to be part-time. And also, the law allows children to remain on their parents' plans until they turn 26. This has proven to be one of the more popular Obamacare provisions and has helped lower the uninsured rate of that age group. Workers also no longer have to pay for contraceptives and preventative screenings such as colonoscopies and mammograms. Obamacare requires these be provided free of charge. Now, the ACA also prohibits employers from imposing annual or lifetime limits on benefits and caps out of pocket spending. So, Obamacare also had an impact on employees who work at companies with fewer than half a hundred workers. Insurers can no longer ban workers with pre-existing conditions or ask them to pay more. The law requires plans to cover an array of benefits, including maternity, mental health, and prescription drugs. And it limits insurers from charging older workers premiums more than three times those of younger workers. However, this more comprehensive coverage has come inevitably at a price. Obamacare's regulations caused premiums to spike, forcing some small businesses to stop offering health insurance to their workers. So that brings us to the individual market. Obamacare has had the largest impact on the individual market, which was largely unregulated prior to the health reform law. The Affordable Care Act requires insurers to cover people with pre-existing conditions and ban them from charging the sick board. The law ended the practice of insurers imposing annual or lifetime caps on benefits, and it also placed limits on annual out-of-pocket spending. It mandates that insurers provide more comprehensive benefits, including medication, maternity, and mental health. It prevents insurers from charging women more and restricts premiums for older people to no more than three times those of younger adults. So Obamacare set up health insurance exchanges to allow Americans to shop for individual policies and created federal subsidies so low and moderate income employees, or enroll A's, could buy policies for less than 10% of their income. It also limits the deductibles and co-payments for lower income policy makers, or policy holders is what I'm trying to say. So nearly 12 million people, about 11.8 million, signed up for coverage on the Obamacare exchanges for 2018. About two and a half million Americans purchased individual policies outside the Obamacare exchanges. They cannot apply for subsidies, but receive all of the other benefits. Many consumers, however, have not been happy with the changes Obamacare wrought, particularly because they caused premiums to spike. Many middle class Americans who don't qualify for subsidies have dropped their coverage saying it's now unaffordable. The Trump administration has sought to undermine the law by providing alternative coverage, such as short-term health policies, that don't have to adhere to all of Obamacare's provisions, particularly those protecting people with pre-existing conditions. It is also allowing states to apply for changes to their Obamacare programs. 
the main beneficiaries of these efforts are younger and healthier Americans who will be able to buy less comprehensive policies with lower premiums. But that brings us to Medicaid. Before Obamacare, most Medicaid enrollees were low-income children, pregnant women, parents, the disabled, and the elderly. The health reform law opened up the program to low-income adults with incomes of up to 138% of the poverty threshold, 16,700 United States dollars for a single person, in states that opted to expand their Medicaid programs. Now, so far, 36 states and the District of Columbia have expanded Medicaid or passed ballot measures to do so. Nearly 12 million Americans gained coverage under this provision as of the year before yesteryear, 2016, the most recent figures available that I've been able to find. Under the program, the federal government paid 100% of the cost of the expansion population for the first three years and is slowly lowering the reimbursement rate to 90%. So here in California, where we're leading the coalition to fight back, we've got a new administration with brand new plans. And internal documents that I've been able to source describe how Governor-elect Gavin Newsom could accomplish universal health care in the state nation of California. Because of the political hurdles to single-payer discussion in Sacramento among health care providers, insurers and patient advocates have centered around extending coverage within the current model. Achieving universal health coverage in California would require a multi-pronged approach that could include automatic enrollment in covered California for the uninsured and a vast Medi-Cal expansion for undocumented immigrants, according to confidential documents advising Governor-elect Gavin Newsom on health care. Now, the campaign white papers, which were cut loose, leaked, if you will, detail suggestions to then-candidate Newsom from his health care advisory team in September. Now, remember, I was a health care advocate for years. My connections in the medical community and the medical industrial complex be vast. There's no problem for me to obtain these documents. Now, while these documents only propose outline ideas, the intent of the group, which worked for nearly a year, was to shape California's health care agenda once Newsom took office. Now, Newsom campaigned as the health care governor, at first throwing his weight behind a single-payer system for tramping down references to the payment structure and focusing more on universal coverage. In the last few months, he stressed that changes will likely be gradual instead of an immediate overhaul, given the potential costs and potential challenges. Now, just last week in Fresno, Newsom said, I have a record, as you know well, we did universal health care for all undocumented residents in my city and county of San Francisco, of which Gavin Newsom was my mayor. Hmm. So to go back to what Newsom was saying, to quote as he, Newsom talking here, he says, so I've got a record of support for the ideal, but there's a practical side to this, and that is I've got a budget to balance, and you have competing interests. So we've got to address all those issues together. So while exact details of his approach remain scant, Newsom said he has seven or eight variants on a health care document, and that everyone's got opinions and advice. Now, the documents I myself obtained split ideas into two categories, single-payer and multi-payer. Both address the possibility of relying on Newsom's experience in establishing a universal health access program in San Francisco, which launched in the year 2007, the very year my late and sainted sire, my father George Joseph Henry Dietrich, died. 
but they acknowledge the challenges with extending the approach statewide. Healthy San Francisco isn't insurance, but gives San Franciscans access to the county's extensive public health network. I was on that program. I was also on Covered California for a while. So these programs I'm mentioning have impacted my life personally, and I've been on them in the past. I'm now on Medicare and Medicaid combined because, of course, I've been proven to be disabled in the sense that I'm compensated for that because of my post-traumatic stress disorder. So with all of that in mind, when I obtained copies of the two papers, they addressed the delivery system. The group which produced documents on a range of different health topics, such as mental health and Medicaid, well now, some of that's covered here as well. Because of the political hurdles to single payer, discussion in Sacramento, the capital of my state, among healthcare providers, insurance, and patient advocates, like I was for over a decade, has centered around the extending the coverage within this current model, and it makes this multi-payer memo more immediately relevant. In that document, the advisors suggest a range of options, including eligibility extensions, expanding Medi-Cal to all income eligible undocumented immigrants, which has already been an ongoing effort. And already the two bills have been introduced regarding this subject, AB4 and SB29 for this next legislative session. The white paper says this would have the single greatest impact on reducing our uninsured rate. Then there's the individual mandate. The federal government repealed the tax penalty for individual coverage, but some states have already established their own mandates. California could enforce a penalty or an opt-in plan that would automatically enroll residents in covered California but give them the option of opting out. Then, of course, there's the option to increase subsidy and Medi-Cal support. The state could use its own funds to help those who make just over the income level to qualify for subsidies pay for the coverage. Other suggestions include exploring a public option to compete with private coverage, increase Medi-Cal provider reimbursement, and require nonprofit hospitals to take a minimum percent, such as 10% of Medi-Cal patients. And one can expand outreach to Latino residents. Over half of the state's uninsured population be Latino. The group suggested that if the state extends Medi-Cal to undocumented immigrants, it should also invest heavily in marketing to reach that population in Spanish. Noting that substantial investment will be needed to put a Medi-Cal card in every eligible adult's hand. And, of course, we have the need to block the Trump administration's proposed change to the public charge rule. Federal officials be considering a rule change that could prevent someone from becoming a legal permanent resident if they rely on social welfare programs. State legislators have rallied against that change, and the Newsom document suggests California should take the lead of states suing the federal government to limit the finalization of this regulation before it worsens our social safety net for years to come. The other memo analyzed various types of single-payer systems while acknowledging the challenges in getting the Trump administration to approve the necessary waivers to make such a system happen. The ideas included keep private insurers in the game, set up single payer, but allow private insurers to continue operating as Medicare Advantage equivalents, which would allow for insurers like Kaiser or others to maintain their enrollees. Create an employer pool formed under the Trump administration's expanded association health plans. California employers could set up a private organization to purchase insurance as a single risk pool and negotiate for rates or establish all-payer rate setting 
this would involve creating a commission that would set rates for all hospital services within California. Last year, a bill with a similar approach, Assembly Bill 3087, by Assemblyman Ash Cowra, a Democrat from San Jose, faced tough industry opposition and failed. Now, few people connected to the working group, physicians, patient advocates, insurance experts, health executives, would talk with myself about the papers. Kristen Jacobson, founder and executive director of Autism Deserves Equal Coverage, was part of the group. She praised Newsom for diving deep into health policy before the election, though she wouldn't talk about what the group discussed. Instead of telling me about Newsom, that he's a self-declared policy wonk, and it was very gratifying to see a senior politician at such a high level in California and with a national presence to care about understanding all sides of a policy issue. Now, another member of the working group, Jerry Seelig, founder and president of Seelig Plus, Chrisig, HCO, a healthcare consulting firm, said the panel included some single-payer advocates, but most of the members focused on the more immediate and practical ways of expanding coverage, whilst generally keeping the current system intact. Now, while well, Governor-elect Gansom Gavin Newsom has publicly supported single payer. As I said, he's also stated such a system could not happen in at least a few years, in no small part because it would require support from the Trump administration, which hopefully will be gone within a few years' time, hopefully before even. To quote a C-Link, the tension between the pure single payer and the majority of people in the working group reflected the same discussion going on with the people making and spending money on health care is that the discussion should be universal, not single payer. But let's go on to the week ahead. I know there's only so much people can take of uh, health care. Uh, as an advocate for many years, I had to discuss all of these subjects uh, ad nauseum for hours on end with administrative law judges who ultimately decided the life and death fate of my parents, whether they would receive treatment or not. Now, ultimately, I won, uh, and my parents survived for a decade longer than they would have otherwise. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the rest of you need to appreciate that struggle, though all of you should, because many of you have parents that are getting elderly and will be in the same position I myself was once in, pioneering your lives ahead for you. My parents, unfortunately, serving as the battering ramps for a better quality of life for your parents when they got older, when they get older, as they're getting older. So with the week ahead, important to remember, ex-FBI chief James Comey heads back to Capitol Hill on Monday for a second closed door interview before two House committees. After his last visit, President Donald Trump accused Comey, sans any evidence whatsoever, of course, of lying to lawmakers. Whilst Comey said he was exasperated over being grilled about Hillary Clinton's emails. Poor son of a bitch. Now the next shoe in special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation could drop Tuesday when ex-National Security Advisor Michael Flynn be set to be sentenced. Mueller says Flynn, the highest-ranking Trump administration official to face charges, shouldn't go to prison for lying about contacts with the ex-Russian ambassador to the United States because Flynn helped prosecutors with at least three ongoing investigations. Now, on Wednesday, the Federal Reserve be expected to announce another interest rate hike, though the central bank has signaled it would be flexible on plans to raise rates in 2019. That's what brings us to the economy. And that may be pretty much the core of tonight's transmission before I move on to the war against California via the firestorms. 
in the Trump years, which have been less than two so far, the United States debt under Donald Trump's administration has grown by two trillion United States dollars. 1.9 trillion, to be precise. That's roughly the size of the Republic of Brazil's gross domestic product. Under Donald Trump, the United States debt grew by the size of the Brazilian economy in less than two mother-sucking years. United States government debt be on track this year to rise at the fastest pace since 2012 as a stronger economy fails to keep pace with the wave of red ink that's rising under the Trump administration. Total public debt outstanding has jumped to 1.36 trillion United States dollars or 6.6 percent since the start of 2018 and by 1.9 trillion United States dollars since President Donald John Trump took office. All this according to the latest Treasury Department figures. The latter figure of nigh 2 trillion United States dollars be the size of Brazil's entire GDP or gross domestic product. If this year's growth rate be sustained through the end of the year, it would be the biggest jump in percentage terms since the last year of President Barack Hussein Obama's first term when the economy needed fiscal stimulus in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Now, as of Monday, last week, the United States' debt stood at a record 22 trillion United States dollars. The borrowing be needed to cover a budget deficit that expanded by an estimated 779 billion United States dollars in Trump's first full fiscal year as president. The widest fiscal gap in half a dozen years. By the end of Trump's first term, the debt be expected to rise by 4.4 trillion United States dollars, despite historically low unemployment, relatively low interest rates, and robust growth. No. Fights over fiscal policy have been making news lately, and the acrimony between Trump and the House Democratic leadership doesn't engender confidence about compromise plans coming together anytime soon. Government funding for some agencies runs out after December 21st, barring an agreement over the budget. Whilst the statutory debt limit has been temporarily suspended through March 1st, though the Treasury can take measures to keep paying the government's bills for a few more months. Then, too, in order of banning the Trump administration from denying asylum to people crossing the southern border between ports of entry expires this Wednesday as well when a hearing be set in my own city and county of San Francisco to review it. A federal judge here last month pointed out the fact that Donald Trump be trying to rewrite immigration laws sans Congress's approval, whilst the administration, of course, has called our ruling absurd. With both sides dug in on the budget fight over Trump's promised border wall, a partial government shutdown may be in store this Friday. If that happens, well over 420,000 government workers, including Department of Homeland Security, and Customs and Border Protection agents be expected to work without pay. Another 380,000 federal employees, including at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the National Park Service, would be furloughed. Even though Trump continues to insist Mexico will pay, or be paying, right now, 
according to him, for a border wall. He apparently hasn't discussed it with the nation's new leadership at all. That brings us to the wall that wasn't. How Trump let his goal of building a border wall slip away. President Donald Joe Trump had several chances to secure money for his project. The administration demands to cut legal immigration, and yet it scuttles all the deals. President Donald Trump has ripped off numerous opportunities to secure billions of United States dollars for a border wall. And with Democrats set to take control of the House, that goal could be out of reach forever. Trump's best chance for border wall funding at the level he wants came in February 2018 when Republican Senator Mike Rounds teamed up with Independent Senator Angus King on compromise immigration legislation. It included $25 billion United States dollars over a decade to build a wall along the southern border and a path to citizenship for so-called dreamers who were brought to the United States illegally as children. It also barred green card holders from sponsoring adult children for permanent residency and reoriented enforcement priorities to focus on criminals in the country illegally. Now, Trump torched the bill as a giant amnesty for narrowing the scope of deportations and complained that it didn't end diversity visas or stop chain immigration, his derisive term for laws that allow American citizens to sponsor siblings and parents for green cards. Amid fierce White House opposition and a veto threat from Trump, just eight Republican senators voted for the bill. With support from Democrats, it got 54 votes, but that was short of the 60 needed to advance in the Senate. A separate immigration proposal, backed by Trump himself, got just 39 votes. Then there was no clear path. Now, with Trump and congressional Democrats at an impasse over the wall money, and with a lack of a clear path toward forward, Bringing a heightened risk of a partial government shutdown starting next fucking Friday night. Republicans be expressing regrets over the deal that slipped away. In a Wednesday interview, Rounds of South Dakota said, We had 54 votes without support from our leadership or from the White House, and there were 45 Democrats who agreed to spend $25 billion in the United States dollars, not only authorized, but appropriated, over a 10-year period of time. I still think it's the correct thing to do. I think it would have been a step in the right direction. It needs the president's support in order to proceed. Now, Senator Lamar Alexander, a Tennessee Republican who backed that bill, said it solved the DACA problem, gave the president what he wanted on border security, and Alexander said, there's a lesson in the failure. We better take these opportunities as they come. And there's a life lesson for you. From the worst coach of all. But they had a second chance. A second opportunity for Trump presented itself in March. When Congress faced a deadline to fund the government and the two parties began negotiations to attach immigration provisions to the measure, Congressional Democratic leaders offered the president $25 billion in the United States dollars to build the wall in exchange for a path to citizenship for undocumented youth eligible for DACA. But the White House and Republican leaders opposed that and offered only a two-and-a-half-year protection for DACA beneficiaries in exchange for the $25 billion United States dollars to be expended on their motherfucking wall. Democrats, to their credit, said no arguing that it would permanently give Trump his wish while leaving dreamers in limbo after a few years, according to people familiar with the negotiations at the time. And so the talks fell apart. Nine months later, Trump's best hopes of securing his campaign promise to build a wall be gone. Democrats, who recently won control of the House, have rejected his plea for $5 billion in the United States dollars to begin building a concrete wall as part of a spending bill the fun part of the government. And the deadline looms. Republican leaders who still control the House and Senate are stuck with no ready way to get such a measure through Congress. No concrete proposal has been offered to break the stalemate. No vote has yet been scheduled on a government funding bill. 
before the money runs out after December 21st. Fresh off winning 40 House seats in a wave election, Democrats' price of negotiation for a wall has gone up. Speaker and waiting Nancy Pelosi of California said last Thursday she'd oppose fully funding Trump's wall in exchange for a permanent DACA solution, saying it would be immoral, ineffective, and expensive. And number two, Senate Republican John Cornyn of Texas said it's a shame that Pelosi be no longer willing to consider a DACA deal for wall funding. It's a missed opportunity, so he says. Senator Dick Durbin, the number two Senate Democrat, said Trump believes that his hard line on immigration be one of his real strengths with his political base. Durbin also added he gave him every chance for his god-awful wall back in February on a bipartisan vote if he would solve this problem with DACA and the parents involved. He walked away from it. We don't know that we can trust negotiations with him on that issue based on that experience. The standoff intensified after an acrimonious Oval Office meeting Trump held Tuesday last week with Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer of New York, in which a visibly angry president threatened a shutdown over the wall. The quote is Donald the Trump verbatim, I will shut down this government. I am proud to shut down this government for border security. Well, if the shutdown talks got you down, know that it literally gets brighter from here. That's because Friday be the winter solstice. When the sun appears at its most southerly position, it's the shortest day of the year in the northern hemisphere, where it marks the start of winter. Now, winter upon us. Let's talk a bit about understanding California's deadly fire as I promised I would, from a Native American perspective. Now, let me see, uh, five, six, seven, seven, eight, yeah, we could go maybe an hour with this, and pretty much cut it off after that, give everybody a break. Now, more than a month after the campfire, so named after the Camp Creek Road in Butte County, where arson generated it, killed 86 people. Much remains unknown about California's deadliest wildfire on record. But more information is emerging. According to a Times analysis of data from the Butte County Sheriff's Office, most victims were in their 70s, 80s, and 90s and died in or near their homes. Infirmity and sometimes stubbornness played a role in their deaths. Meanwhile, just days after a lawsuit blamed Pacific Gas and Electric Company's equipment for starting the fire in an attempt to shut down all of our power generation here in the state of California by the federal government and its agents provocateur, that utility told regulators it has found the smoking motherfucking gun bullet riddled equipment and felt branches on power lines at the ignition points. Start with the heartbreak first. Many victims of California's worst wildfire were elderly and new data shows they died in or near their homes. So that makes us start with the Paradise Fire deaths. Let me name a few for you so you can get some of the human angle on this. Some faces that you can imagine as I give you the names. Rose Farrell is the oldest victim of the devastating campfire to be identified thus far. She was 99 years of age and she died inside her home on Herman Road in Paradise. Eva Holt, 85, died inside a pickup truck after she was evacuated from Feather Canyon. Gracious retirement living. She made it only a mile. Richard Brown, who was 74 when the blaze overcame him, died underneath a vehicle. He managed to travel less than a quarter mile from his home in the tiny Sierra Nevada town of Concow. The campfire killed 86 people. Of those, 53 women and men 
have been identified by officials so far. On Thursday last week, the Butte County Sheriff's Office released the locations of where their remains were found. Although the victim's official causes of death have not been released, search teams have described finding bones and bone fragments in the ashes. Now, the Times received the locations after filling two requests, filing them, and an appeal under the California Public Records Act. The county initially refused to release the records, even after family members had been notified about the deaths and the victims' names had been publicly released. But the information relayed via the Los Angeles Times, and then ultimately through myself to you, paints a terrible picture of age, infirmity, and in some instances, stubbornness. The victims who have been identified range in age from 39 to 99. However, 60%, over half, were in their 70s, 80s, or 90s. 60% also were found inside homes, buildings that under normal circumstances offer comfort and refuge. 20% were found just outside of residences. Eight individuals' remains were found in cars ostensibly headed for safety. Larry Smith, an 80-year-old from Paradise, died at UC Davis Medical Center. He was badly burned while attempting to put out the flames that engulfed his car. It'd be impossible to know what caused so many of the fire's victims to remain home while thousands of their neighbors fled. Many people in the mountain community never received an official evacuation warning. Some of those who heard warnings of looming danger might not have been mobile enough to heed them. Others chose to stay put as the deadliest wildfire in California history bore down upon them. The remains of Victoria Taft, 67, were found inside the home on Copeland Rise, Copeland Road, if I remember correctly, actually, it's on a rise, so I think of it as a rise, but her remains were found inside the home on Copeland Road in Paradise, where she lived with her 25-year-old daughter, Christina. The pair didn't receive any official evacuation order the morning of November 8th, but a neighbor knocked on their door to tell them about the blaze. At 10 a.m., Christina made a decision. They needed to leave, but her mom wanted to stay. She'd been on the phone with a friend who also chose not to flee. The mother and daughter fought. After much pleading, Christina left. She took their only car. As she headed toward Chico, a harrowing trip that took nearly two hours, Christina realized she might never see her mother again, and she was right. Christina related, to quote as she, I was defeated, but I could have waited longer. Maybe I could have gotten someone else to convince her. The remains of James Garner, a 63-year-old Navy veteran, were found inside his mobile home on Woodbury Drive in Megalia. His sister, Linda Balco, said a relative who lived two blocks down from Garner had knocked on his door and urged him to leave the morning of the fire. Balcom confirmed that Garner used a cane, had back problems, and couldn't move very quickly. To quote his sheet, he didn't believe that the fire was coming up that way. He had never seen anything like that. I think he was just too stubborn to leave his home. Eva Holt's remains were found near Pearson and Stairs Road, about half a mile from her unit at the Feather Canyon Retirement Home. Holt's daughter, Linda Dighton, said someone who worked at the facility had helped Holt into a pickup truck and tried to drive her out of danger. The truck was on Pearson Road, heading toward Skyway, the route to safety, when traffic came to a standstill near Stearns Road. Then there was an explosion. Authorities confirmed the truck caught fire. They told Titan the Feather Canyon employee was able to pull one passenger out, but her mother was already too injured from the flames to be removed from the vehicle. Holt, a retired dietitian, had lived at Feather Canyon for four years. She loved to play pinochle and go shopping. She was in good health for her age. That was confirmed by Titan who also lost her home in the campfire. The remains of Julian Binstock, 88 years old, were found inside the 
Feather Canyon home. One of the grimmest discoveries was the carnage along Edgewood Lane, where at least six people died. The remains of two women and two men who appeared to be neighbors were found in one or more vehicles at the intersection of Edgewood and Marston Way. They were fleeing to safety, but they ended up halfway between their homes and a dead end. One survivor of the blaze, an older dog owner in a rickety jeep, recorded a video along Edgewood. It's but three minutes and 32 seconds long, sepia-toned and posted on YouTube, where I myself reviewed it. It begins with what's left of a body curled on the ground and goes on to show burned-out cars with skeletal remains, flesh-torched, cleanly off skulls. The shaky voice narrator describes some of the dead as friends and acquaintances. He marvels that he made it out alive. He says, these people got burned out in the cars like I almost did. Dead, dead, dead. Everybody here be dead. And now, the shit sucking motherfuckers who burned our state to the ground caused this misery, caused this pain. They're trying to pin the blame on our Pacific Gas and Electric Utilities Monopoly so that they turn it all off. Electric utilities are under increasing pressure to shut down power lines completely during dangerous weather conditions to stop fires from sparking. Meaning that they'll put people in blackout conditions, and for many people that means their water won't run. State officials want to make sure those shutoffs don't do more harm than good, which is precisely what they do, especially with the elderly, who would depend on the electricity for heat or air conditioning. The California Public Utilities Commission has voted unanimously to begin crafting new rules for turning off electricity when fire risk be high. The agency's moves follows a second straight year of devastating wildfires across California, some of which were started or may have been started by electric utility equipment. None of this is super. But questions of liability have led to what I've been exposing. Just days after a lawsuit blamed Pacific Gas and Electric's equipment for California's deadliest fire, that company has submitted a letter to regulators saying they found bullet riddled equipment near a second ignition point for the blaze. And I told you there were many more than one. So PG&E highlights bullet riddled equipment and down tree branches near campfire in its letter to state regulators, just days after this lawsuit blamed a bad utility giant's faulty equipment, so claimed, for California's deadliest wildfire on record, same company submits a letter to regulators saying it found bullet-riddled equipment, felled branches on power lines, probably taken off with a power saw, elsewhere, within the fire's own massive footprint, within the fire's footprint, which be quite massive. Think of Bigfoot on flame. Bigfoot as a living volcanic entity, an anti-god of fire. And within region of that, the source of his generation sawed off branches that take down the power lines and machine gun addled equipment. Now I was able to get a copy of this letter sent to the California Public Utilities Commission on Tuesday where in Pacific Gas and Electric Company said that a worker on November 9th found bullet riddled PG&E equipment and a felled power pole in Concow. And that days later, another worker discovered branches on top of wires near Concow and Rim Roads, an isolated crossroad leading up to Flea Mountain, north of Concow, where the campfire burned last month. Four customers on the mountain near those two locations had experienced a power outage about 6.45 a.m. November 8th. So wrote PG&E 
in their utility letter. Just as winds were driving the campfire into Concal Megalia and eventually into Paradise, which was more than 90% destroyed by the blaze that killed at least 86 people. Now, this lawsuit filed on behalf of survivors Monday pointed to other pg e equipment, a failed small metal hook that was supposed to hold up a transmission line, and an insulator on a tower in nearby Polja as the likely culprits for starting the fire. The utility acknowledged in Tuesday's letter that it did detect an issue with the equipment near Polja about the time the campfire be believed to have started in that area. But the potential, the reality of a second and even third ignition point for the fire, ones that weren't caused by a failure of pg e equipment, most definitively play a role in assigning liability down the road. If investigators find that fires started in either the location of the shot-up equipment or where branches fell on the power lines and either of those fires overtook and consumed the blaze that started near Polja, whoever be responsible could shoulder any civil and criminal liabilities for the devastation that followed, and I can guarantee you the slime trail leads directly to Donald John Trump. Ultimately, to his master, Vladimir Putin, teaching him the scorched earth policies of the Soviets. Which he used in his own Ardain offensive to set fire to the West. Under California's liability laws for utilities, PG&E shareholders would have to absorb the cost if the utility was found to have caused the fire by neglecting to maintain its equipment. If its equipment was properly maintained but still caused the fire by, say, tree branches falling onto the lines and creating a shower of sparks that ignite grass below, pg e customers could also be on the hook for some of the liability costs, not just the shareholders. That was their intention when they started this was to spread the pain everywhere. Utility officials declined to discuss the possibility that a private citizen shot their equipment and sparked fire. They referred instead to their letter to the California Public Utilities Commission. Meanwhile, the utilities proposed a rate increase to the commission that it said would help fund wildfire prevention efforts. More than half of the new revenue would fund a series of safety measures, including stronger and more resistant or resilient poles and covered power lines across 2,000 miles of areas with high fire risk and smart meters to more quickly detect fallen power lines. The proposed increase would raise a typical residential customer's gas and electric bill by about $10.57 a fucking month. Now, Attorney Steve Campora would be representing over 400 campfire survivors in litigation against PG&E, said he believed this the utilities letter being an attempt to shift responsibility away from the company. To quote, see, I think that's why they're talking about it, but I don't think that's what happened. He just doesn't want it to be so. So far, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection has not announced a cause for the campfire, though it has said there were two separate ignition points, confirming that there were at least two separate ignition points. That's arson. Teaching his own letter status, and I read this from in front of me, on November 9th, 2018, a PG&E employee on patrol arrived at the location of the pole and observed that the pole and other equipment was on the ground with bullets and bullet holes at the break point of the pole and on the equipment. On November 12, 2018, a PG&E employee was patrolling Concow Road north of the bullet site when he observed wires down and damaged and down poles at the intersection of Concow Road and Rim Road. This location be within the campfire footprint. At this location, the employee observed several snap trees with some on top of the down wires. The lawsuit filed against PG&E this week argued that the utility giant has a history of putting profits before people and claimed that a cost-cutting culture resulted in an equipment failure that sparked the fire. The suit alleges that PG&E has diverted necessary safety-related expenditures into funding corporate bonuses, boosting shareholder profits and or fueling advertising campaigns, whilst ignoring the serious and irreparable nature of the public safety threat posed by its aging infrastructure and ineffective vegetation management practices. An attorney in the litigation told the Los Angeles Times 
his firm plans to file 60 to 100 campfire lawsuits in the coming months, including several wrongful death suits on behalf of families that lost loved ones. The campfire started the morning of November 8th, and within hours, overtook three mountain communities on its way to becoming the deadliest and most destructive fire in modern state history. Evacuations were hampered by limited escape routes and a wind-driven blaze that carried red-hot embers from home to home, secluded within the tinder dry forest, sparking one fire after another. Firefighters said it moved so fast that their only mission that morning was to help people escape because battling the fire was futile. It burned more than 153,000 acres before it was fully contained. PG&E released a statement alongside its report about the second and third damaged equipment sites. The loss of life, homes and businesses in the campfire be truly devastating. Our focus continues to be on assessing our infrastructure to further enhance safety, restoring electric and gas service where possible, and helping customers begin to recover and rebuild. Throughout our service area, we be committed to doing everything we can to further reduce the risk of wildfire. Now that brings us to our graphic references for tonight, the two maps we produced that definitively prove racial and ethnic minorities be more vulnerable to wildfires. Now, I want to give everybody an opportunity to assess those while I try to contextualize them. Over the last decade, the United States has seen an average of 70,512 wildland fires every year. Every fucking year, 70,000 and half a thousand atop that. Every year, annually burning approximately, we can only approximate it, 7 million acres, 6.8 million to be more precise. With climate change, scientists expect fires to become more frequent and more severe. However, some people be more affected by these events than others. Our work, completed on November 2nd, show us that racial and ethnic minorities be significantly more vulnerable to the effects of these natural and unnatural disasters. The results provide us a new perspective on where resources to mitigate wildfire threats be best allocated. We were inspired to study this question by Hurricane Katrina, the catastrophe that ripped through New Orleans in 2005. Black neighborhoods were located in the low-lying, less protected areas of the city, and many lacked the resources to evacuate safely, or at all. After the storm cleared, black-owned homes were three times more likely than their white counterparts to be in the flooded parts of the city. And to this day, the city's black population has never rebounded, and never will, to pre-Katrina population levels. Other research on floods and hurricanes has shown similarly disproportionate effects on minorities. We wondered if a similar phenomenon existed for wildfires. The first map on wildfire potential shows just that, as determined by the United States Forest Service by census tract. White lines on the map correspond to United States census tracts. The potential for an area to burn be calculated by considering factors such as burnable fuels, combustible materials on the landscape, vegetation, weather, and historical fire activity. Using data from the United States Census, we created an index that characterizes a community's ability to adapt to wildfires. Example like Ratia, signs that a community be less able to adapt to a wildfire include a prevalence of older or younger individuals high rates of poverty, and a high proportion of people who be not fluent English speakers. We then calculated this metric for more than 70,000 centrist tracks across the United States and combined the results with the area's potential for wildfires as modeled by the United States Forest Service itself. Our analysis revealed that wildfire vulnerability be spread unequally across race and ethnicity. 
although affluent white Americans be more likely to live in fire-prone areas. Non-white communities in fire-prone areas appear less able to adapt to a wildfire event. Communities that be majority black, Hispanic, or Native American be over 50% more vulnerable to wildfire compared to other communities. Native Americans in particular be six times more likely than other groups to live in the most vulnerable communities. The next map produced the, the fire vulnerability map. This map shows wildfire vulnerability by census tract. Wildfire vulnerability takes into account both landscape, wildfire risk, and socioeconomic factors in determining how likely an area be to adapt and recover from a wildfire. Overall, some 30 million Americans live with significant potential for wildfires. Land managers off prioritize areas with extreme wildfire potential for active management, regardless of the capacity of individuals to absorb and recover from a disaster. By including a community's capacity to respond to wildfire, we highlight those places that may be less resilient to a wildfire's catastrophic impact. How can land managers and policymakers use this information to more effectively combat the impacts of wildfire? Current uh, efforts by agencies and non-governmental organizations have largely focused on reducing the risk of fire. But no matter how effective such management be, there will still be wildfires across the United States. They be a natural, indeed necessary, part of many ecosystems. However, natural resource managers can further reduce vulnerability of people to fire by increasing the adaptive capacity of affected communities. There be already some services in place. For example, some state and country agencies have cost-sharing programs to help homeowners reduce fuels on their properties, whilst others offer educational programs to help communities adapt to wildfires. However, there be evidence that socially vulnerable populations be less likely to participate in these types of government programs. Cultural differences may also affect preferences for fire management. For example, black Americans have shown more reluctance towards some fire management practices, such as prescribed burning, than their white counterparts. All loss of life be tragic, and the devastation caused by property loss be terrible for all victims, no matter the race or ethnicity. Like some other scholars, we feel that it's time to stop thinking of natural disasters as natural at all and start thinking of them as the consequences of social, economic, and political factors that make communities more vulnerable to ruin. In many cases, it's all out war. It's red Republican insurgency in California's case. This year and the year before. Facing the rising risk of fires due to climate change or war, communities must make certain that emergency planning and mitigation strategies be inclusive of vulnerable minorities so that no one be left behind. Because there's no option to live without fire in California. Once in what be now Northern California, a fire burned across a grassy hill and against the base of an oak. It left a black scar on the tree but didn't kill it. Soot from the fire settled out of the air into a nearby lake. It drifted to the lake bed and soon was covered with other sediment. Five or ten years after the first fire, there was another. Back then, fire came often. Tree ring scars and charcoal layers in lake beds can tell scientists how off fire visited those places. By joining many of these records, experts can stitch together a portrait of how the land burned over centuries and cross continents. Now, I'm told we just went offline, that there was static and we were taken offline. So I'm going to ask my executive producer to check in on that. And, of course, a uh, follow-up. And, uh, obviously, this is just uh, frustrating. I'll get some messages from uh, our, uh, our executive producer, 
Pavel Edward. And uh, Dianera Michon has been saying over the last two hours there's been so much static in Cincinnati that she can't hear much. So we're going to uh, follow up. Our executive producer's checking into it. The good news is that if he hears me, we're on record. And if we're on record, then that means that we'll be, you'll be able to hear all this. And uh, even if you miss it now. And as well, it should be up for replay when we're done at the top of next hour, hopefully. And after that, you can review it at your leisure. And hopefully, it'll be much better sounding. Now, what I was outlining was the fact that tree ring scars and charcoal layers and lake beds can tell scientists how all fire visited various places. By joining many of these records, experts can stitch together a portrait of how the land burned. Okay, we are offline. So we're going to hold on for a bit. I'll wait until I get the go ahead from my executive producer. If we get that go ahead at all, we might have to shut down for tonight. Or we're going to restart the call. Paul Edward with a sign. I'm trying to finish it in this hour. We might still be able to do that. It did reconnect. I can uh, continue then. Just give me the go ahead. I presume that that's my go ahead to speak. I've got a poor network connection on my Skype, but uh, that's always the case, especially in the rain like this. Okay, cool. Our man says to uh, forge ahead. So we're going to continue to trailblaze. So I was talking about in Northern California, you would have fires burning across grassy hills against the bases of oak trees, leaving black scars, but not killing the trees. Soot from said fires settling out of the air into nearby lakes, drift into the lake bed, soon covered with other sediment. Five or 10 years after the first fire, there'd be another. Back in the days prior recorded history, fire came oft the time. Tree ring scars and charcoal layers and lake beds now tell scientists how off fire visited those places. By joining many of these records, experts can stitch together a portrait of how the land burned over centuries, cross continents, Fire ecologists estimate that when Europeans arrived in North America half a thousand years ago, an area more than twice the size of New Mexico burned across what be now the lower 48 states each and every year. In California alone, fire annually burned an area bigger than Connecticut, ignited by lightning or California Native American Indians. These fires burned unhindered for months at a time creeping through forests, sprinting across grass and brush for millennia, thousands of years, in what be now the greater San Francisco Bay Area metroplex region. Summer and fall brought smoke. But then slowly, the fire stopped. By the early 1900s, Native Americans were no longer lighting fires because the majority of them had been exterminated. And many Americans of European descent moved to cities. Yeah. In his book entitled Fire in America, fire scientist and historian Stephen Pine, surname spelled P-Y-N-E, first name spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N, like Stephen Myers, he writes their attitude in America toward fire change. They deemed fire a problem 
and began snuffing it wherever they could, like a candle, trying to drive it from the landscape. Mostly they succeeded. The California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, or CAL FIRE, says that of the thousands of fires that start annually in the parts of the state where it manages firefighting, it prevents 95% from getting bigger than 10 acres. That means the total area that burns in the lower 48 states each year be no bigger than Maryland. But it now seems that in trying to solve the problem of fire, we've only postponed it to a more extreme effect. This fall, the Bay Area was once again shrouded in smoke. The fires that started October 8th and 9th killed dozens of people and destroyed thousands of homes and businesses across Napa, Sonoma, and Mendocino counties. They were a human tragedy and an economic catastrophe, the deadliest and costliest fire in state history. In some ways, California was especially vulnerable to fire this fall. The five-year drought that ended last spring in the accompanying bark beetle problem, which has left more than 130 million trees dead across the state, and the heavy rain that followed birthed a flush of brushy vegetation. But for all the ways the recent fires were unique, they closely resemble other disastrous fires that have burned across the state in recent decades. The 2003 Cedar Fire in San Diego destroyed 2,800 structures and killed 15 people. The 2015 Valley Fire near Clear Lake destroyed nearly 2,000 structures and killed four people. The 1991 Tunnel Fire in the Oakland Hills destroyed almost 3,000 structures and killed a quarter of 100 people on my own solar return for a birthday that having been set by Michael Aquino's cultists in direct retaliation for the closure of the Presidio military base that I brought about. Then there was the 2017 Southern California fires that continued to burn in late December that year. These are the kind of fires that remain. They burn when it be hottest and driest and the wind be howling when fire crews can't fight them. In trying to stop fire, it is as if we tried to stop the wind and the rain but in our hubris. We're left with only hurricanes and the situation be getting worse. The number of acres consumed by fire each year in the state is growing and the number of buildings destroyed annually has increased dramatically over the past few decades. Climate change be a factor. The length of the state's fire season has increased by more than two months since the 1970s. And seven of the ten largest and eight of the world's most destructive fires in California's recent history have occurred since 2003. As the state's population has grown, expanding into the wildlands, so are the number of Californians in harm's way, with more than two million homes now in locations at high or even extreme risk of damage from wildfires. Now, holding up the 2017 fire season as a vision of the near future, Many are arguing for a change in tactics in our long war against fire. Scientists, environmentalists, federal, state, and local officials, and even the head of Cal Fire all agree that a century of fire suppression be largely to blame for our current predicament. But for all the years, efforts, money it took for us to banish fire, it may be just as hard to bring it back. In the fall of 1542, the conquistador Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo arrived with three ships off the coast of what be now San Diego. Ethnobotanist Cat Anderson wrote, he saw green valleys, broad savannas, and a great pall of smoke. There be little lightning in coastal California, so smoke most certainly meant people. How long have people been lighting fires in California? UC Berkeley archaeology professor Kent Lightfoot informs us that the oldest known archaeological sites in the state beyond the Channel Islands and date to around 13,000 years ago. 
Greg Cyrus, tribal chairman of the Federated Indians of Graton Ranchera, suggests that indigenous peoples have lived in the state much longer, perhaps since before the beginning of the last ice age. However long they've lived here, by about 6,000 years ago, the inhabitants of central and northern coastal California were numerous enough to begin shaping the landscape to their purposes. As I said, nature throughout the American hemisphere, be all man-made. Even the Amazon rainforest be a human artifact. I've gone into that in great depth before. Native American Indian activities are recorded on the landscape. That's your Akashic Records, people. Mother Earth herself, terra firma, her face has been plastically re-sculpted Cosmetically engineered by a Native American Indian, archaeologists have uncovered the plant remains of extensive coastal prairies all around what be now the greater San Francisco Bay Area metroplex region. In a 2002 study, United States Geological Survey fire ecologist John Keeley wrote, such prairies would have been quickly overrun with brush and trees without fire to clear them. Although the Bay Area gets few lightning strikes, some of these prairies persisted for thousands of years. Peter Nelson, a tribal citizen of the Federated Indians of Grayton Ranchera and assistant professor of archaeology at San Diego State, who studied vegetation preserved in an ancient house near Tole Lake in southern Sonoma County, says it was this whole system where you get a more biodiverse and productive landscape. To quote as he, fire made the land more habitable for people to keep the brush at bay, creating conditions attractive to deer and game birds. It promoted the growth of berries, willows for use in basketry, and other important plants. It made traveling easier. For millennia, the indigenous people of central and northern coastal California used fire to create the landscape they desired. Speaking of the United States more generally, the author Pine of Fire in America, that book, P-Y-N-E, he writes, the scene that Cabrillo and other Europeans found was not wilderness, that they believed it to be closer to the truth, be that Europe found a garden and has tried to render it into a wilderness. White people be the weeds. They be the bull weevil. They be the garden blight. Archaeologists say that when Cabrillo sailed up the California coast, the Bay Area was one of the most densely populated parts of North America home to tens of thousands of people. Over the next centuries, most of them died of European diseases or were mass murdered in white genocide. Pine writes that European Americans continued to use fire as an agricultural and landscaping tool for a while, but as they moved to cities, they came to see fire as a threat. Eventually, cities expanded back into the woods and fields, mixing together in what fire scientists call the wildland urban interface, a fractal fringe of wooden and oftentimes wooden roofed houses that were, from a fire behavior perspective, jackpots of fuel. Meanwhile, the garden grew wild. The landscape was no less flammable than it had ever been. It only rarely burned. Three weeks after the start of the fires in Napa, Sonoma, and Mendocino, I myself was driven by my surrogate son through the remnants of a neighborhood on the north side of Glen Ellen, southeast of Santa Rosa, along State Highway 12. Now, this was all part of our photography session, which we took photographs of myself and a subject that I put together in a portfolio on the fire, which I found my uh, relation after the fire's end. Now, the first fire started around 9.45 p.m. October 8th, followed by 21 more fires in the next six goddamn hours. There's no fucking way that's natural. No fucking way in hell. But carried by winds that gusted to 70 miles per hour. Those fires sped through vegetation left dry at the end of a long, hot season. And for Cal Fire Staff Chief David Shu, you don't put something like that out. You just try to get people out of its way. All told, the fires killed 44 people and damaged or destroyed some 9,000 homes and buildings, all that in that area, that being the largest loss of homes in the state since the 1906 earthquake. Now, that's confirmed by Mark uh, Gilarducci, director of the California Office of Emergency Services, 
More than $9 billion in the United States dollars in insurance claims have been filed so far. The fire has painted the landscape with a surrealist brush. Here would be an intact split rail fence surrounding the home gone missing. Here would be a set of wooden stairs up to a second story deck, now freestanding in a field of ash. Charred washer dryers and brick chimneys poke from the ruins everywhere I look. The blackened ground was flecked with golden oak leaves, dropped in the days after the fire. Then we rolled slowly down the block past FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency workers in yellow vests. Talked about the yellow vests in Europe some other time. Hard hats, of course, everyone was required to wear one, and face masks out looking for hazardous materials. Near the end of the street, we found a man named Phil Clover sifting through the remains of his house. He was tanned, wearing a ball cap and a flannel shirt tucked into his jeans. Clover looked at least two decades younger than his 83 years, and he knew that uh, because he unpromptedly pulled out his driver's license to verify such. I guess he felt self-conscious or maybe even defensive because my own uh, claimed to be over half a century of age and my looking some decades younger. Now, 1 a.m. on the night of October 9th, firefighters woke Clover and his wife and told them to evacuate. His wife packed some of their things and went, but Clover stayed behind. Says he never saw the main noon's fire. He said, the wind was whistling and the air was filled with smoke, and then there was a blizzard of red little sprinkles coming down, what a fire ecologist would call firebrands. Said they didn't hurt when they landed on his skin, but they caught the grass on fire. He raced back and forth with the garden hose, putting out the little fires that grew from the brands. On the front lawn at the base of the eucalyptus near the chicken coop, it was while he focused on the coop that the wood pile caught fire. The fire spread to his fence, to the storehouse, then to his home. There was a sound like a jet engine and a brilliant white light. He retreated to his car, parked in the open space at the end of the driveway, and sat there through the night, breathing the air conditioning system's recycled air, watching his neighbor's houses burn one by one. Farther south in Glen Ellen, near Jack London State Park, we met Tracy Salcedo. Her street be densely wooded, scattered with houses, some burnt, others not. I knocked on her door because I noticed that her lawn was charred within feet of the house, which looked unscathed. She'd evacuated, she told me, but her neighbor had stayed behind. With a garden hose, he managed to keep the small flames at bay. Across the street was a house that did burn, and it must be pointed out that what Clover and Salcedo's neighbor, who did not want to be interviewed or named, did, what they did was something you must never do. It was dangerous. Don't do what they did. By staying behind to defend their property, people be taking a huge risk, not only to themselves, but to the fire crews who might end up rescuing them. There'll be some debate about whether California should adopt a policy like Australia's, prepare, stay, and defend, or leave early, in which well-prepared property owners be given the choice of staying behind, in which case there will be no rescue crew. You are on your fucking own. For now, though, in California, it remains more a discussion among academics than among policymakers and firefighters. There be currently no communities in the state where I, myself, would ever endorse a stay-and-defense strategy, even as an option. But maybe at some point, there could be a time when that becomes a viable option. What I'll try and discuss within this hour may bring us to that point. For now, in California, it remains just that discussion. So, Salcedo's property, nestled in the woods, seemed vulnerable, but more houses survived there than in Clover's neighborhood, where the homes sat on flat ground with big yards between them. Jack Cohen, a retired Forest Service fire scientist who studied how buildings ignite, says it's usually people imagine that wildfires burn through a neighborhood in an advancing wall of flame, burning house after house like some bombing raid or tsunami. 
What actually happened is be more commonly like what Clover described, firebrands, like evil, malevolent, fiery folk, igniting small fires at once, thrown off by vegetation or burning structures. These brands can travel for miles ahead of the main fire. Fire crews be ill-equipped to stop these scattered blazes, and many of the small fires have time to grow into big ones. Cow fire says the majority of the homes destroyed in the October fires likely ignited this way. Homeowners could be better prepared. The day after the fire nearly burned her house, Salcedo and her son tried to fireproof it. They cleared the shrubs growing along the walls, felled a small plum tree by the front door, emptied the gutters. These kinds of steps taken in advance would be off what separate burned houses from the unburned ones. Home ignitions depend mostly on the 100-foot radius around the house and especially on the 5-foot wide space immediately surrounding the building. It's important to make sure those areas won't carry fire to the house itself, as they did at Clover's house, and as they almost did at Salcedo's. Similarly, roofs should be made of fire-resistant materials and vents should be covered to keep out brands. But if a lack of homeowner preparedness was to blame in Clover's neighborhood, the problem would be bigger than it seems. In Google Street View images of the neighborhood taken before the fire, which my son showed to me, of being rather handy at accessing that sort of thing. It looked just like anywhere in California. You could swap it out for similar neighborhoods in Walnut Creek or San Diego or San Jose. The message of Glen Ellen fire, if there be one, be this. When conditions be ideal for fire, suppression fails, and places that hadn't seemed vulnerable suddenly are. It's a hard thing to reconcile. To quote Salcedo, I don't think anyone who lives in a place like this forgets about fire. It's more an idea that it just won't happen to us. But as multiple fire scientists have told myself, there'll be no, no fire option in California. Over time, fire will always return. They concluded that in suppressing fire, we've really only made a trade, swapping more frequent, less dangerous fire for less frequent, far more dangerous fire. For decades, scientists and environmentalists have been arguing that we ought to trade back, even if that means we have to light the fires ourselves. Now, earlier in the fall, I had traveled to Kings Canyon National Park for a brief period of time. Now, that was when I was actually on a joyride with an escort. But we joined park employees and area fire crews while they lit prescribed fires. It's kind of a way of, uh, it's kind of foreplay for setting our own fires. But the park's iconic giant squires, we noted, were able to survive repeated small fires. And the clot of vegetation that grew up over decades of fire suppression threatened many of the groves of giant sequoias with deadly crown fire. Foresters have been lighting fires in Kings Canyon and the adjacent Sequoia National Park since the late 1960s, the decade into which I myself had entered this vale of tears through my late St. Cyrus's birth canal. And the effort be known as one of the best, longest-running prescribed fire programs in the West. So, I, myself, donning on a pair of borrowed green pants and a yellow jacket, followed a crew of hot shots down a scrubby hillside as they lit it on fire. They walked amid the brush, waving drip torches, thermoshaped cans with curly cue sprouts that dip of fuel mixture past a flaming igniter. And Tony Caprio, a United States Geological Survey fire ecologist who helped plan the burn, informed myself that this was the third prescribed burn in this roughly 100-acre section of Kings Canyon. The last time was in the mid-1990s. The goal for that day's fire was to reduce the combined weight of living and dead vegetation in the area by 30 to 60 percent. Sometimes it'd be more practical to thin vegetation by hand or with machines, but here the comparative elegance of fire be clear. It leaves no mess of wood chips or sawdust, no torn ground. Though blackened, the forest looks open the way it did when Europeans first arrived. The prescribed fire promotes favored species, including the giant sequoias, whose seedlings sprout only on bare ground and reduces competition between older trees, making them more resilient in the face of drought. 
The firefighting benefit of prescribed fire be evident when I visited the edge of the 2015 roof fire, which burned 150,000 acres, 151,000 acres to be precise, and nearly reached the park's Grant Grove, which contains the world's second largest tree on planet Earth. The fire made it within shouting distance of the tree. General Grant is the name of that particular botanical phenomenon. But then it hit an area where a prescribed fire had burned. The change in the wildfire's intensity would be still clearly visible nearly two years after the rough fire. On the untreated side, all the trees but the biggest giant sequoias do dead snags, while the uphill, prescribed burn side looks untouched. If one were there to tell me, I wouldn't have known, or rather if no one were there to tell me, I myself wouldn't have known that there had been a fire on the uphill side at all. Now the smoke from this prescribed fire was light gray when I was there. It smelled like a campfire. Nothing like the acrid haze that enveloped the greater Bay Area metroplex region during the October fires. Dar Mims, a meteorologist at the California Air Resources Board, says that just as there be no fire choices in California, meaning we don't have any no fire choice in California at all, there be no no smoke choice. Smoke is going to accompany a fire. So Dar Mims off gets calls from people concerned about smoke from prescribed fires, and he informs them that the Air Board generally sees the small, brief releases of smoke from prescribed fires as infinitely preferable to a wildfire's toxic gout, which might last for weeks and affect a quarter of the fucking state. So, per Mims, the more we can do fuel reduction, the better it be for air quality. So I followed the hot shots down the hill along the trail, and at times there were hints of a wildfire's danger. When I walked back up the hill, some of the flames had grown to 10 or 15 feet in height. So hot that I had to shield my bare hands from the heat. And the fire roared and lapped high up the trunks of dead snags and smoke billowed across the trail. The biggest objection to prescribed fire be not the smoke, but the possibility it'll escape. Because the fire doesn't know it's supposed to be prescribed. In 2012, a prescribed fire southeast of Denver, Colorado, escaped and burned 16 houses and killed three people. Over a decade earlier, an escape fire entered the town of Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the autumn bomb had been built, destroying some 300 homes and buildings. There have been dozens of other escapes and near escapes each year over the last few decades, occurring in roughly 1% of prescribed fires. But Scott Stevens, the UC Berkeley fire ecologist, says the potential for unintended consequences can make the practice a hard sell to the public. Anytime you do something like that, there'd be risk. But there'd be risk, of course, every time you take a vaccine. The risk of runaway fires be part of the logistical tightrope that the burn bosses, I spreaketh with, say they must walk in lighting a prescribed fire as they try to hit the meteorological conditions that will promote a fire that carries without growing too powerful, get approval from air quality districts, and secure both the money and personnel to carry out the work. The fire crews I met, then lighting fires, had just come off weeks of fighting fires across the western United States. Legal liability, too, be a constant word. Yet despite all these hurdles, prescribed burning seems to be gaining support in California. In 2015, as part of a settlement of long legal dispute between Sierra Forest Legacy, a conservation nonprofit, and the Forest Service, the two parties signed a memorandum of understanding in which they agreed to, in part, increase public education and awareness in support of ecologically sensitive and economically efficient vegetation management activities, including prescribed fire, forest thinning, and other fuel treatment projects. Now, 22 other parties joined the memorandum or have since joined, including CAL FIRE, the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Sierra Club, and several of the state regional air quality management boards. Craig Thomas, the conservation director at Sierra Forest Legacy, says the broad group of signatures reflects a growing mutual recognition that fire exclusion has been a bad idea. 
In the March 2017 State Assembly hearing, Cam Pimlot, the director of CAL FIRE, told members of the Assembly that prescribed fire be the best way to reduce the intensity of wildfires. To quote to see from CAL FIRE's perspective, certainly prescribed fire fuels treatment be a priority. I myself met Sasha Burlman just down the road from Glen Ellen at the entrance to Bouverie Preserve a month after the North Bay fires. And we drove up from the road, passing a few cows resting in a burnt field on one side and a woodland on the other. And we parked in a lot overlooking what used to be a large cluster of buildings. Bowman, uh, being the resident fire ecologist at Autobahn Canyon Ranch, the conservation nonprofit that manages the preserve. And she led the way down to the bird buildings, followed by her dog Chicago, small yellow curly thing, and Bowman had spent October 9th at the preserve trying to save what she could. The area had been washed with firebrands thrown by the knobcone pines two ridges over, and by the time she'd arrived that morning, many of the buildings were already on fire. With the help of a retired Cal Fire Chief, she managed to save the historic house of David Bovary, who founded the preserve, but most of the buildings were lost. We walked past her boss's house, burned to its foundation, Chickens were meandering around the wreckage. Kids' toys lay scattered in the yard. She'd been planning a prescribed burn in the dense oak woodlands adjacent to the compound. The historic buildings weren't designed with wildfire in mind, but still, she said, she kept thinking if she moved one more year or had one more year to get those fuel treatments done, there'd be a good chance those buildings would have survived. And of course, I'm certain she's correct. We walked up the path east into the hills above the buildings, and on the north side of the path was an oak and bay woodland. The tree's leaves stuck out uh, all in the same direction, as though someone had dragged the bows with a pomatic comb. The fire came through there so fast that the hot wind sucked all the moisture from the leaves without catching them on fire. The ground beneath the trees was charred deep black, on the south side of the path, just a few feet away, the ground was still brown, the grass unburnt. This was one of the areas where, of course, that lady had lit a prescribed fire last May. Now, illustrate it that way. With the aftermath of prescribed fire on one side and fire suppression on the other, it seemed an easy choice. If not an outright panacea, prescribed fire at least seems capable of righting many of the wrongs of fire suppression. Looking around in that environment, in any environment where fire be, which be fire prone, you'll find plenty of examples of people lighting prescribed fires. In the North Bay alone, land managers at Point Reyes National Seashore, state and county parks, and land trusts have all employed fire to manage fuel loads and encourage native flora and fauna. Some 18,407 acres have been burned in the Bay Area over the last decade. That's according to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. The problem be one of scale. The current enthusiasm for prescribed burning be digging out of a deep hole. This fiscal year, Cal Fire aims to treat 20,000 of the 31 million acres in its purview with prescribed fire, and even more in the future. This would be a drastic improvement over years of burning only 2,000 or 3,000 acres, but it regularly burns 60,000 plus acres as recently as the 1980s. Now, the new numbers may not sound like a lot when we talk about needing to burn 3 or 4 million acres across the state. Now, one of the things that Kinlot also noted during the March hearing was that although the number of wildfires has grown substantially between 2015 and 2016, the agency has still achieved its goal of keeping 95% of non-prescribed fires on the lands it manages to less than 10 acres. As David Shu told myself, that goal kind of flies in the face of the natural ecology of the landscape a fact that Cal Fire be well aware of. So although the Forest Service and other federal land managers have been able to walk back somewhat from all-out suppression, sometimes leaving fires burning under preferable conditions, Cal Fire be more constrained. Daniel Burlant, the department's assistant deputy director, says the majority of the land they protect be privately owned.
inhabited by homes, structures, and infrastructure. In the North Bay, 81% of the fires were on private property. Choosing to let those fires burn was not an option. As the wildfire season stretches, the amount of time that CAL FIRE's seasonally employed fire crews have for prescribed fire and other vegetation management, as well as defensible space inspections, shrinks markedly. The state's leading firefighting body be trapped in a cycle of fire suppression. Relief will likely have to come at least partly through the efforts of private landowners. Bill Keene, general manager of the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, says that before the October fires, the district wasn't actively working on fire prevention with landowners on the conservation easement, say, manages. Going forward, though, he says, fire will be part of the conservation, which might mean allowing activities on easements that wouldn't have been allowed in the past, including prescribed fire. Lenny Quinn Davidson, director of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council, who leads prescribed burning workshops across the state, pointed out that as the use of prescribed fire by Cal Fire declined in recent decades, its use also declined with private landholders. And uh, this was uh, concurred by Scott Stevens, the UC Berkeley professor, by myself when I cross-referenced with him. So decades of fire suppression has left the Western United States with relatively few people trained to carry out the work. We just don't have that experience to pass on. But it's important not to let the current enthusiasm for controlled burns pass. As climate change continues to push conditions towards extremes, as wildfires consume more and more of fire agency budgets, and as the wildland-urban interface continues to expand, it'll only become more difficult to bring fire back. During the May prescribed fire at Bouverie, Borman, who studied in Stevens' lab, was joined by 12 different fire departments, including members of the National Park Service, the Great Rancheria, and Cal Fire. And Borman says there were 75 firefighters there, far more than needed for the 20-acre burn. But the fire was also meant as a training day, an opportunity for firefighters to experience fire in its more benevolent form. Now, when Borman and I were continuing up the hill, Earlier, down in front of what had been the preserve's main building, she pointed out a statue of an egg ray, now surrounded by ashes, of course. And people had been comparing the long-necked bird to a phoenix, she said, but she thought they were maybe looking too far afield. She was saying that she keeps telling people they don't have to turn mythical creatures, for example, to rebirth from fire. Because as she and I were climbing, we passed turkeys and a deer and a flock of roosted doves. The ground was blackened but speckled with golden oak leaves. And that's what made me come to my epiphany of solving the West wildfire problem, meaning that we have to solve human problems. Now, I'm going to have to continue another half hour to explain this. So I'll take us to the bottom of the hour now, and then we'll quit for the night. With every room for native ecological practices in California's fire management, but we have work to do first. Since last year's devastating North Bay wildfires struck a five-county region in Northern California, destroying 44 lives and almost 9,000 homes, the residents, business leaders, elected officials, tribes, scientists, managers in the region have been engaging in a long process of introspection. The scale of that disaster forced the examination of some long-neglected truths about our place in the landscape, our place in our watersheds, and our obligation to be better stewards for the sake of our very own lives. Now, one of the things that uh, motivated a professional escort to drive me out to a controlled burn was because, like many professional escorts, she actually had a day job, or at least a more recent career, before she decided she could make more easy money doing something that would bring her a lot more pleasure in the immediate sense than simply professional gratification from helping humanity. 
She was a watershed steward for the North Coast Regional Water Board. And it was simply the October before last that she found herself working far outside of normal duties when her office led the state's post-fire erosion control response. Now, the fires happened just as she and her staff had expected rainy season to start. So they'd been working with extreme urgency to armor the 617 streams affected by the fire since discharges of toxic materials, sediment, and ash from burned properties were engulfing the entire region. Whether it was the physical remediation work for the community or a very moderate rainy or both, they were spared significant impairment of their already suffering waterways. And as they worked through their first post-fire winter, the community reflection process began in earnest. Many had heard of, and some even experienced, the major fire prior to strike that region, the Hanley Fire of 1964. What was less widely known was that the Hanley Fire was actually the third major fire to strike that area. Others haven't taken place in the very year my late and sainted Cyrus was born into this world in Tokyo, the year 1923. And another fire had struck before then in 1871, all within the same three to four week period in late September, early October. So prior to her work at the water board, she had spent nearly 15 years at the San Francisco Estuary Institute, building out the state's only fully staffed historical ecology program. Her emphasis, aided by her graduate work at UC Berkeley, was fire ecology, specifically indigenous fire management in coastal California. And with that background, many of the questions that followed the last two traumatizing fire seasons proved especially meaningful to her. And armed with new realizations that fire be a natural part of California's ecology, along with the reality that even for those residing deep in an urban setting, few be truly immune to its potential ravages. Many residents and land managers alike have been searching for new solutions. And questions have emerged about the fire traditions of local California Native American Indian tribes. So could a solution lie in those traditions of the original peoples of the First Nations? But to answer that question, an acknowledgement of some history be required. First, we have to acknowledge that prior to colonization, tribes burned most of California on an annual basis. That alone can be a challenging reality for postmodern people to contemplate. Perhaps the most notable non-Native researcher on Native fire traditions, Omer Stewart, found it impossible to convince his fellow academics funders and publishers of this very real and genuine fact. He concluded after interviewing scores of descendants and immigrants and reviewing 76 references that, with one or two exceptions, all of the major tribes and subdivisions set fire to California. As Kroeber reported, uh, Kroeber, excuse me, K-R-O-E-B-E-R, as Kroeber reported, if the cultural pattern concept has any validity whatsoever, these data leave room for only one conclusion. Burning over was not, as Krober so reported it, considerable, but was absolutely universal. Wherever vegetation was sufficient to carry a fire. Now, here, of course, Omar Stewart was referencing Krober, the original researcher on this very subject. So uh, the name is used in that context. Now, I get this out of a book, of course, the book in front of me that I'm reading from, entitled Forgotten Fires, Native Americans, and the Transient Wilderness, a posthumous collection of the work of Omer Stewart, published in 2002, after Homer Stewart died, of course. In this work, he writes, the evidence presented here leave us no room for doubt. And it leaves us no room to minimize the role of the original peoples of the First Nations, the Native American Indians, 
in the complete burning to which California fields and forests were subjected by saying something so profoundly insipid and vapid as lightning being the major cause. In other words, all talk of lighting, lightning, setting your world on fire is a crock of shit. And that it was the red man, the early American, the real Americans, that were setting your world on fire. But here I come to the real tragedy. Stewart's work, his research, could not be published in his lifetime. The first publisher who committed to consider the work replied to his manuscript by stating, your manuscript as it stands is in perfectly impossible shape, and no reader could give the time that would be required to deal with it. Uh, he wrote something similar to Deep Draconic, apparently, and decades passed with little progress. Within six months before his passing in late 1992, his last effort at publication failed because the work was, quote-unquote, too out of date to be published in its original form. So by the time that anyone even considered publishing it, they said it was too late and dated because no one ever wanted to publish it when it was current. This is what in the military we call SNAFU bar, an acronym for Situation Normal, All Fucked Up Beyond All Recognition. But misconceptions about the ecological role of native burning have roots deeper in California's history. Mexican governor Luis Antonio Arguello forbade traditional tribal fires in 1827. After statehood, Section 10 of the 1850 Act for the Government and Protection of Indians stated that any person was subject to fine or punishment if they set the prairie on fire or refused to use proper exertions to extinguish the fire. The original language of this section was changed from Indian to any person in the final version of the law. A year later, in his first State of the State address, California's first European-American governor, Peter H. Burnett, dedicated fully half of his address to conflicts with the state's original inhabitants, stating, The white man, to whom time is money, and whom labors hard all day to create the comforts of life, cannot sit up all night to watch his property, and after being robbed a few times, he becometh desperate, and resolveth upon a war of extermination. This be the common feeling of our people who have lived upon the Indian frontier. The two races be kept asunder by so many causes, and having no ties of marriage or consanguinity to unite them, they must ever remain at enmity. Consanguinity means blood relation. There's no, there's no blood of, of relation between the red man and the white man, so they must remain forever enemies. Now, I continue what he has wrote to read it to thee. That a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be not only expected, but welcome. Now listen to this. You wonder why I have such contempt for the white trash sewer shit that has flooded North America and turned it to the darkest continent on all the surface world, in which I, as a truly civilized man, born of Asia, descended from these various people that you deem savages, be stranded now amongst you white savages, and why I hold you all in such contempt. Listen to this line. That a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must not be simply expected but must be welcome. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race be beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. This is dated January 6, 1851, prior to the American Civil War between the states. This is where we stood as the First Nations of California for over two centuries, at war, subject to annihilation, 
And even the most studious non-native advocates and intellectual allies marginalized these original peoples, the real Americans, like myself. And as the decades pass, trends in federal Indian policy have evolved from paternalism and assimilation to tribal self-governance and self-determination. And still, academia has been slower in keeping pace, and secular land management slower even still. But coming back around to our core question, might a solution to our modern fire quandary lie in native burning traditions? Perhaps. But might I suggest that this young, modern, colonial society has some homework to do prior probing too far into what might be a deeply sensitive question for tribes to answer. For starters, amend the Wilderness Act. This act has come to define for this nation what is meant by the word natural, at least in the realm of ecology and management of natural resources. He considers something to be natural when it be absent of the influence of humans. In essence, this foundational piece of legislation excludes tribes and their management of natural resources from what this nation considers natural. It also fails to acknowledge the role of humans in the alteration of global climate processes, begging the question, be there any place on Earth that's natural anymore? Second, in this 300th year, or at least 250th year, of a colonized California. Perhaps it be time for the state to truly invest in its relationship with tribes. While Indian policy largely resides in federal hands, there'd be nothing to prevent the state of California from improving these off-strained relationships. If there were more native Californians in the employ of state resource agencies, if more state grants were awarded to tribal projects, if tribes were adequately consulted in major resource management decisions, perhaps the solution to this fire quandary would present itself rather than your needing a mediator, a hybrid, Douglas Dietrich, to present this to your Vulcan intervention. Modern fire scientists have been pointing to the critical concern of fuels accumulation for decades, but public policy and funding has largely ignored even them. There'd be no traditional knowledge solution to that. If you're not going to listen to the wise men your own culture has generated, where does that leave us? Similarly, there'd be no traditional management system for large-scale reduction of surface fuels and stand densities. There'd be a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done, driven by Western science, to get our forests, hills, and valleys back to a condition where age-old cultural practices would make sense as a maintenance strategy. But in the meantime, perhaps we can work on the social, political, and cultural solutions to the human problems that have led us down the path towards ecological collapse. A collapse in which, as I said, if you're not listening to your own wise men, the scientists, where does that leave men as myself who are functionally shamans? But it's in that light. We're far from the bottom of the hour. I'll see if I can burn bandwidth for a bit more. This is where it would be such a privilege if only we could bring on Pavel Edward, our executive producer, to help take some of the load off myself for some of these issues that I try to discuss. But with that, maybe we can dedicate just a little bit of what's going on with the Yellow Vest protests in France. Because we started off, of course, with the Ardennes Offensive, which took aid off Hitler's forces nigh all the way to Paris. And now Paris is coated in smog of tear gas as the yellow vest protests continue. 
Now, a lot of this is, of course, France's far right seeing gold in the yellow vest movement. Now, all of this is personally offensive to myself because I'm the person who first identified the insanity of the alternative right identifying themselves as patriots. And I disambiguated myself by differentiating myself as a nationalist. Of course, everybody caught on, and now everyone's using the term nationalist. And uh, they refer to someone as myself as a globalist. So my own former executrix producer, Laura Lee Solomon, published a post on her timeline, falling prey as she's been, spiraling ever more rightward and downward, some alt-right propaganda meme showing the yellow vest as nationalism, kicking out, of course, the dehumanized rodent, a rodentine human being, which represents globalism. The same kind of graphic representation they used to use for the Jew back in the days of rampant Judeophobia. Now, in one sense, I will be the first to tell you I am a globalist because we have global problems and they can't be solved nationally. You can only solve a global problem globally. So, with that in mind, the idea of quote-unquote nationalism being a panacea or a solution be beyond absurd. It's the anti-godly weapon used by the Aquino cult against the future of humanity. So, all of that, of course, brings us to what be going on in Europe, which is, of course, Vladimir Putin's insurgency, the same shit that's been applied to destroy the United States, and that may ultimately prevail in tearing apart European Union, which currently be the largest economy and its most dynamic on planet Earth, on the surface world. And of course, because Vladimir Putin and his Eurasian Union could never come anywhere near that level of prosperity, the only thing they can do is sabotage it and tear it apart and bring it down to their motherfucking Russian level, into the gutter, into the sewer of white trash, slime, and shit. So, in order to accommodate that, his insurgency has appealed to the lowest of the low, the human garbage heap. And all of these people have gotten together to protest for the sake of protest. These are riot armies. And these riot armies are designed to tear Europe apart, to tear apart the very heart of white civilization. And they're supported by the white supremacists. This is the horrific irony of the situation that the Caucasian race has painted itself into. So, France's yellow vest protesters aren't against climate action just because they oppose Emmanuel Macron's proposed fuel tax hike, amongst so much else that's utterly incoherent. 
does not mean the French activists will oppose any policy designed to fight climate change. So what they are instead is something that they themselves can't even identify. They have so many points of contention that what they're doing is they're simply trying to instigate revolution by uniting with motherfucking Russia as their sponsor in an all-out assault against the chimera of globalism. Now, the last time that France maneuvered into a dependency on motherfucking Russia, the world ended. The doomsday machine of 1914 was born. Whenever the Gallic peoples try to unite with the Slavs to put a vice-like grip, a pincer maneuver, apply that pressure against the Teutonic peoples, the Visigoths, in the center of Europe. It's not only a foolish, but ultimately an ultra-destructively dangerous maneuver. When the Franco-Russian alliance came into being and surrounded the central powers of the Second Reich and Austria-Hungary in a vice-like grip, the result was World War I and the devastation of France and the loss of the majority of its prime real estate and its population and arable land that produced food was lost to Mother Russia. It resulted in the worst for both participants in the conspiracy against Germany. This is what's being replayed now. And it's important to remember that France itself, at its height, when it was an empire that held the world in its thrall, when the world looked in awe and fear on the grandeur of Napoleon Bonaparte and his empire, as I stated before, no empire that great is ever born of provincial nationalism. All great empires are international by the very intrinsic nature of empire. That's what makes it empire is that it goes beyond the borders of the core nation. That means it embraces a larger part of the world around it. That means it has to become internationalist. It goes global. The only people who can carry empires to that level of grandeur and accomplishment are people who are non-natives, people who are not part of that provincial Limitation. This is why I pointed out that Napoleon Bonaparte was not French. He was ethnically Italian. So you have an Italian man born on the island of Corsica, which at the time that he was born, his own mother, who brought him into this world, was fighting as a revolutionary who was considered a terrorist by the French nation, she was fighting for Corsican independence. And the French solved the problem, not by killing Napoleon Bonaparte's mother, but by selling Corsica, or exchanging it strategically, to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And therefore, at that time, Forgive me, I actually got it backwards. 
trying to look back on the history at this time that I'm ready to shut down the transmission. At that time, the reason she became a terrorist fighting for Corsican independence and that problem became solved, it was solved by the Austro-Hungarian Empire by either selling or exchanging strategically the island of Corsica for lands elsewhere or territories elsewhere or simply for cash, selling it to France. And at that point, Napoleon Bonaparte became a French citizen or was born a French citizen. Now, had that not happened, had Napoleon not been born a French national, then what would have happened is he would have been an Austrian citizen, a citizen of Austrian empire. And as I said, because he was loose in France, which was collapsing into revolution, he first tried to apply for officer's commission with the Muslim Turks of the Ottoman Empire. And they refused him because they didn't believe his turning towards Islam was sincere. They didn't believe him a true convert. Now, I had mentioned before, if he had grown up a citizen of the Austrian Empire, he would have almost certainly had converted to Greek Orthodox Christianity and become the heir to Dracula himself in terms of being realized as the ruler of a new Byzantium. And people have asked me since that time why I came to that conclusion. Why would he not remain Catholic, which was the religion of the Habsburgs? The reason why was because Napoleon was such a massive mover and shaker on the stage of world history because he was able to relentlessly adapt like a chameleon, just like Adolf Hitler, using foreign tactics because he himself was a foreigner. He was not German. He was Austrian. Napoleon Bonaparte, being a foreigner, being an Italian, whether he was Austrian or French, he was such only by nationality, but by ethnicity was Italian. He understood the need to adapt and the expansion of an empire. It had he been Austrian, the primary enemy would have been the Muslim Ottoman Empire. He would have kicked down the Ottoman House of Cards, the sixth man of Europe, and, of course, to do so, he would have had to have motivated the peoples of the Balkans, who would only have followed a person of the Byzantine Orthodox faith, who himself would practice the Eastern Rites liturgy. And therefore, he would have become Greek Orthodox in order to mobilize the Balkan peoples. It's merely logic. It's political expediency. And all war be but extension of politics. So for that reason, with his military objectives in mind, he would have politicized his religious choice of faith. That's what brings us to the hypocrisy of the ignorant white trash pieces of shit rioting in their yellow vests in mother-loving France, who forget the heritage of the pinnacle of their civilization. Napoleon Bonaparte and his foreign cosmopolitan, indeed globalist, origins and aspirations. They have no vision of a future. They have no vision of a future because they can't even understand their past. Now America has never even come to that crossroads yet. There's been no Alexander the Great, no Macedonian foreigner to lead the Greek. There's been no Joseph Stalin, a foreign Georgian, a hill cracker from the Caucasus Mountains, to come and lead the Slavic people as an alien horde beneath his heel or jackboot. In America, all you've had a white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. You might say, well, we had Barack Hussein Obama, the first of the black pharaohs, to rule over the declining dynasty of America. We're at the Nile on the Hudson. 
or the Nile on the Mississippi. But what you have here was never an empire that was built by Barack Hussein Obama. He didn't think in those terms. He was simply doing his best to survive within the matrix of legitimate government. Now, our government's legitimacy is being torn asunder by the American version of the yellow vest, the alt-right red Republican insurgency. And the reds are tearing this nation apart. And when it reunites, it will no longer be the constitutional republic of old. It will be a reconstituted America. And as a reconstituted America, there will, of course, be elements that secede. The South, both New Africa and a new confederacy of whites in the Northwest will have a massive reservation for a white Aryan American Republic. The rest of the West, back to the Native Americans in primary influence, if not in numbers. And for the rest of America, going from the Northeast all the way down through the northern states of Aslan, the northern half of Mexico, all the way through to the free state of California, you'll have the new hybrid race. A new race will walk the earth, truly calling themselves Americans, non-native, but hybridized like myself, of many ethnicities. That'll become the America the world identifies as an actual race comprising a global body. The problem with the United Nations is that the United Nations is many nations. The United Nations doesn't have a people that serve and swear their allegiance to the United Nations alone. This new America will replace that United Nations. It will help with peacekeeping the world over, with projects that help people develop in the third world, with climate control and macro engineering projects, up to and including the terraformation of Mars and Venus. And that'll be the race of this new America that'll comprise its main body, its main demographic, not the rulers of the world by conquest, but an empire based on management and aid, universal health care, and public administration. Other nations will retain their sovereignty, but all nations will turn to this, the new America, as an empire of care, of aid and assistance, and a race which will be detached from the nationalist struggles that the other empires will represent as they continue to war with each other. We will be turned to as the consultants for resolution. Well, let's end this transmission on that note. That's just a bare outline minus the details of what my Vulcan intervention intends to bring by my status as a foreign alien to the original ethnic composition of the America that was known to this point in history prior America finding its Macedonian Alexander, prior to America finding its coming Caesar. Because with the death of Republic comes the birth of Empire. Well, my love unto you all. Again, uh, pray for the health of DNR Rishon. Poor dear lady seems to have been under the weather. Uh, hope she's doing well. And uh, good night to Ramona Halitha Henry. Thank you so much. And of course, to my Maki benefactress. Take care. We're going to all be gathered together again on Wednesday night. And uh, in the interim, 
uh, make certain to uh, support myself if you can without uh, in any way uh, inconveniencing or impoverishing yourself. Uh, you can do so by sending check or money order to the address as provided in our video. Also, check out the advertisements. Uh, the website seems to be down for the man of the soil dot coms Tucson murder true crime tours, but his uh, unfinished man website is still up, as is man of the soil dot com. Do check those out. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, want to thank everyone uh, for whatever support they have provided or will provide. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, look forward to our gathering again. Uh, for a longer transmission, more than likely, when we regather on Wednesday. Godspeed. Were you able to grab those graphics I had put up? Oh, wonderful. Bless you. Uh, no, by the way, I wanted to say, uh, sure. Uh, I'm sorry. You were saying, wait, man. Oh, wonderful. 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 Yeah. Well, um, how am I sounding? Because it's, it's raining in San Francisco. So it says I've got a poor network connection. So can you hear me? Is what I mean to say. Am I am I coming through okay? Okay, I, I just can't hear you. Good, good, good. What what happens is when when I come on and we go live, then automatically Pavel Edwards sounds like he's underwater and um, he becomes almost indiscernible. It, it becomes very difficult to uh, understand what he's saying. So I are you coughing? Oh my god, I hope you're in good health. I hope you didn't catch them. Oh my God, poor guy. Everybody needs to maintain Pavel Edward in their thoughts and prayers. Um, he's, he's probably caught something. His immune system's probably compromised from all the work he's done. He's, he's put up two wonderful uh, videos that we don't want anyone to turn to now, which is why I didn't publish them in posts. I didn't publish the link in post because I'll do that after the show. Hopefully you understand my logic there, right, Pavel? <laughs> that was, I know you put them. Once. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, I know you got the one with Justin White. Right, right. I, I know you got the one with Justin White up there yesterday yesterday but it was even then i felt um that, well first off i was actually had something else that involved me yesterday but by the time it was today there was no point i i my, i felt i should wait till after the show so um and along with that uh, concerning my late and sainted mother thank you so much the one that's dedicated to her um so have you got the link you got the live stream link right yeah, no worries I, I noticed you didn't give me the link to those others to either inside of the text box over the days that you had published them. I guess after you did it, I told uh, I told uh, my Maki benefactress that you were so tired, you probably went right to sleep after you published both of those, <laughs> either one of them at either time. Yeah. Yes, that's what I thought. There we are. Yeah, no, I see the new one. Yeah. And uh, so I, I see the uh, uniform coming out wonderfully, wonderfully. So let me get this up everywhere. And uh, I thank you so much, dear brother. Uh, everybody, uh, we all love Pavel Edward. Uh, without him, there would be there would be none of this. He is truly uh, a man who has earned uh, his title executive producer. He will allow me to share his uh, actual name with the rest of the world sometime soon in the near future. After all, he's pretty fearless already. 
and uh, he, he knows there's nothing really coming his way that can uh, that can harm him. After all, the biggest threat to Pavel Edward is himself. He just works himself to death. You know, when he's not walking out in uh, yeah chill weather, what, what does he do? He goes he goes to walk in the fucking snowbanks and shit. Uh, I I never understood that crap. Uh, you know, he lives in an uninhabitable uh, part of the universe called Canada, which uh, you know human beings were just uh, not evolved to. Uh, to live in, other than, of course, the indigenous Inuit. Um, let me get this out of the way. And, uh, and what happens is that Pavel fights with them. He goes outside and he fights with the Inuit over uh, who gets to build the igloo and shit. And uh, let me get this over here. Done editing on that. Okay. And uh, I do ask everyone to uh, let me know if they can hear me, of course. I'm sorry, go on, Pavel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People could say that about Manhattan Island too. Actually, we could say that about San Francisco. Uh, you, you know, the uh, with the housing costs uh, for for both those places, that and Hawaii, yeah, that too. Oh my goodness, um, uh, it's just just wherever you have people. I mean, they just uh, it's uh, it's horrible how we all have to, uh, you know, live in these uh, compressed areas, and uh, and there's all this uh, other. Okay, here we are. Take care of this. And, uh, okay, oh, General Dietrich. And of course, I'm going to count on my uh, Grand Madam Ramona Halitha Henry uh, to let us know if we are heard. All right. Take this over here. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. That's that's too bad. I always hate to hear that the, the negative aspect of it. Let me see. Uh, Good. You know, I'm hoping. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I, I'm hoping it's just this. Uh huh. Yeah, you went outside. Yeah. This is like a big deal. This. <laughs> now, uh, so uh, it was this. Uh, it, was it a trip to Starbucks, the hookah bar? What, what was it? So walk. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that the distortion in your voice is a combination of technology and whatever nose cold that you've caught or something, because otherwise you sound like, uh, you know, it, it, it sounds like you've uh, been impacted, like you've got uh, uh, some severe bronchitis or something. <laughs> He's yawning too. Oh my God. I'll try it. Jesus. I'll try not to make it last six hours this time. Well, um, uh, -huh. well, last time. 
Good, good. But last time that I took it to six hours, um, uh, our man Pavel was on the floor. I literally brought him down to the floor with, uh, you know, just keeping us on too long. And he was like, uh, then when I consulted with him after uh, we were off stream, like, uh, where are you, Pavel? Where are you, Pavel? I'm on the floor. Yes, Maybe that's how you caught the cold. Um, but uh, uh, unless you have a rug or something. Oh, thank God. Oh, that's good. I mean, honestly, sometimes people do things that truly worry me. It's amazing what people do to themselves. Okay. 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 Got this down. Okay. Now. Oh, sorry. So it's unbelievable how much time we got left compared to. I can nail this. Yeah, go on. There we are. Yes. That was uh, that was Pavel Edwards' uh, wisdom as gleaned from Richard Simmons. You probably don't know who I'm referring to. <laughs> <laughs> you you do remember him. Oh yes. Is that guy still alive? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, is he still alive? Just because he's exercising, does yeah, does doesn't mean he's alive. I mean, uh, I mean, I think the guy was flaming. So he and he was active. Yeah, he he was active at a time that uh, you know AIDS was uh, pretty rampant. So. Uh, you know, I'm amazed he didn't contract it, to tell you the truth. But of course, that's my stereotype. <laughs> okay, so we've got everybody here. Um, Ra Halifa says she's hearing us loud and clear. Mwah. Thank you so much, baby. Uh, love you dearly. Okay, and uh, let's see what the other ladies are saying, see if they, if they hear us. Um, okay, there we are. Um, and uh, so we're being heard. That's good, as far as can be ascertained. And uh, you know, uh, I can't wait till we get the technology streamlined to the point where we can bring Pavel on. That way, he can share, and people can hear him clearly. And then, uh, you know, he can talk about uh, the things he does, like uh, like when he goes out and has random snowfall bite fights you know snowball fights snowfall fight, snowfall bites i said snowfall bites <laughs> snow i can't even say it <laughs> okay um so let me see we've got god we got a lot of time left we've got eight minutes left before we get started That's right. Yes, you're landlocked. That's that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're not you're not by any big lakes. I mean, I, obviously there's the Great Lakes, but I mean, how close are you? To... Right. Okay. Okay, there you go. I'm sure that lake is fucking freezing. Uh, and, uh, oh yeah, it ices up. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. That's just awful. Oh. Huh? 
Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's that's I can imagine. Uh, that's just awful. Oh, uh, I'm I'm not really much of a nature person. <laughs> that, that is true. Oh, uh, that's. Yeah, I'm 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 really quite the city boy, and uh, happy to be such. The um, you know, the um, you, how about yourself? You were never much a never long on camping, were you? When I was younger, I kept trying to. Camp. By the way, what, what time is it? It's it's uh it's five minutes to the top of the hour, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, that's uh there we are. And uh, dropped my cell phone today, and uh, then it went like uh, about ten minutes off. It's it's uh, shit. It's really off now. And now it's giving me military time, which at 1647, it says right here. But it's like that, 10 minutes off. Uh, I'll have to restart this again. And um, actually, shouldn't even have it near me in case somebody calls. Oh, my goodness. Now you've got me yawning. But uh, so what we're doing is we really... Yes, it is. Yes, we're, we're, we're killing time. And um, am I executive? producer will go mute in about um you know at the top of the hour till then people can just get to hear me slurp and suck on tea and uh um happy to say that my uh uniform post is doing 80 percent better than the other posts on my public community fan page he's still alive um i'll put a wow on that <laughs> ramona halita henry informs us that richard simmons is still alive there is a part of my personality, I must confess, that that is disappointed at that. <laughs> the, uh, oh, God. Um, yeah, that's, I, I'm not sure that's good news. That's, uh, mm. that's, uh, that's cruel. I shouldn't talk like that. Oh. Yeah. I mean, after all, he never hurt me. Uh, well, well, he did. He he did. He, he made horrible, horrible videos. <laughs> <laughs> he displayed himself on 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 this. Yes, yes, yes. He's he's that's. He traumatized me. Yes, that's right. Richard Simmons was like a. It's 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 like a adult horror film that I should never have seen as a child. Yes, that's that's right. And um, uh, out. Uh, so moving right along, the, um, so aside from all that, let's see now, um, uh, Justin White, like, uh, I should bring him on, uh, well, not tonight, but, uh, sometime soon, get his opinion on what's going on in Canada. I'll certainly give my analysis. You'll, you'll never fear. Not that I'm, I'm sure that you weren't, uh, you know, stressing about this, but, uh, uh, rest assured, I'll be uh, providing my analysis in the midst of this transmission of what I feel is, might be going on in Canada, or, or at least my observations. And uh, in terms of uh, Justin, I'm sure he has his. Of course, if he were on with us during this period of time when we're just kind of uh, killing time, burning bandwidth, just uh, providing entertainment instead of information. I'm sure not being familiar with the whole process, he would do what he did last time and just kind of uh, fall back into telling us his life story, the elements thereof, which he never actually repeated when we started burning bandwidth, uh, how he was born a poor black sharecropper's son. Yep. Ah! Oh, cool. 